Good morning and happy Friday to everybody out there and welcome to Beyond the Sim. And I should be honest, it's not Friday for us here. It is Tuesday. We are pre-recording the show, but it is playing Friday live or at least Friday for everybody to see together. Welcome to the show, Billy Strange. How are you doing today, Billy? Good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I've had a really, really great week, in fact, so I'm very good. How about yourself? <laughs> short week that it is. Yeah, exactly. How about you? I already good. asked you that, I guess, huh? Yeah, you did. I you did. You threw me off. You know, and, and to throw everybody off a little more, we have one more person you might remember. Brandon Waters back in the show today. How you doing, Brandon? Hello, hello. I'm fantastic. Thank you for having me back. Um, I appreciate you guys allowing me to come back and you know hopefully fill a little bit of the non-live aspect with some of my uh idiotic ramblings you know sweet we you can were, always use those you were you were missed you were the man <laughs> with the plan for the show and without you i think it kind of runs amok at times no <laughs> <laughs> well i wouldn't say it uh, it never ran amok when i was there um I'm, it did that also from time to time so uh yeah, it is what it is. It's organic. It's just talking about sim racing, and, you know, we all love it, so it's fun to do. Absolutely. So uh, I guess to start things off, why don't we uh, go with uh, what have you been doing? Billy, what have you been up to? What have you been racing? What have you been driving? Well, between Friday and today, I finished up, did my finals in VRC Pro, which is the, the RC sim, ha. Uh, and so I did those and just looked at the results today because they finish up on Monday. And I got second in a couple, third in another one. Like all the ones that I participated in, I made the A except for one. And then you get just kind of like I racing, but this is split into like club, sport, and pro. So most of them I'm finishing where I probably should, about between. 12th to 15th overall so have you seen a guy out there named frosty st Clair? i wasn't paying attention okay um <laughs> and and give me the short answer on this because i think we might come back to this topic in general but when you are playing vrc do you feel like you're taking or playing a diversion game from sim racing or do you feel like it's like switching from my racing to race room or something like that uh that's an interesting question i don't know i didn't really think about it you should just you should mull it, it over and we should come back to that yeah, yeah I'll, well, I'll, uh... I'll circle back to that because <laughs> i you threw me for a you threw a curveball at me i i didn't really think of it and maybe it's because i i raced rc cars irl uh i don't know i have to think about that all right have you that's been doing any other racing I have not been able to touch anything else. Uh, so I did all that racing, I think, on Friday or maybe Saturday. Uh, the rest of the time was prepping because I went into the studio yesterday to record guitar for three songs. That was about a 10-hour day. Uh, but it turned out really, really good. I was I'm incredibly happy and excited with it. We've just got to finish it up. I've just got to do vocals still, and we've got to put the bass in there as well but the drums and the guitars are all done uh yeah it, it i haven't been able to race anything else i don't think so no we'll just okay. leave it with that one well, it really hasn't been that long since we spoke right. i mean oh uh, how about you brandon you, you've been driving racing well i did a lot of real life driving because as you know uh during my what was it four shows that i think i missed in total um in that time, we I, I live out in the Pacific Northwest, and we drove clear back to Tennessee and North Carolina via down through Oklahoma and near Texas. So, um, yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of miles on the road. But uh, when I got back, um, I didn't do a lot of driving the first week I was back just because I couldn't stand the sight of sitting and pretend driving after doing so much rail driving. You mean um, you didn't hop into American Truck Simulator right away? You know, <laughs> I didn't, oddly enough. Um, but yeah, so kind of took a little bit of a hiatus. So I was going to try and get ready for the endurance race that they did this last weekend, but I, it was such short notice, and it's not one of my best 
tracks um, or venues. So I was like, you know, I'm not going to try and interject myself into the team and have them mess with the schedule. And there's so much logistics that goes into setting up one of those endurance races that I really didn't want to throw a wrench into the works. So, and put myself kind of behind the eight ball as it were, just trying to prepare. Um, so I had to basically try and, you know, still help out. I streamed the race, um, just trying to help the team in general, um, trying to represent for Rick Motech since they've been such a good partner and, so I did that, which I never really, I've never done anything like that. So I had never made the correlation that even just streaming and trying to maintain the stream and make sure everything goes smoothly, you're up the same amount of time, if not more oh, yeah. than when you're driving. And it was, it was ridiculous. I felt probably as wiped out from streaming the race as I would have if I had driven. Sure. I... So... I certainly um, understand that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't know how you do it, especially where you do the racing and the streaming and everything else. It's it's a phenomenal feat. So, um, but yeah, that was that was great. The guys did good. You know, kind of typical endurance, overcome adversity and and fight your way back. But um, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. And then since then, um, listening to the show on Friday and listening to Billy talk about his VRC stuff and i had it um i have since you know went all in uh, luckily it was on sale or is on sale as of this recording and uh went all in and bought their their complete package and so i've been doing a lot of that and, and trying to get the old rc car good vibes back so get that fix in oh yeah yeah and man i'm rusty it's been a long time <laughs> <laughs> Um, speaking of the team, since we are on that topic, um, didn't they, uh, pull off quite the accomplishment there at, uh, the hardest track on planet earth? I thought so. I mean, they, they had a couple of technical issues, so I know we know iRacing is probably the best endurance platform there is right now, at least, um, and that's probably arguable from some aspects, but, uh, they achieved something. They had some issues where they got hung up on some of the curbing, just trying to turn around after having incidents, little spins and stuff. And they get hung up on the curbing and had to tow, which put them behind the eight ball. Um, but even with that, they fought their way back and they had an extremely low uh, incident count, in my opinion. And even so much so that I think, uh, do you have the graphic up, Sean? I do. Of that? I do. <laughs> so they ended up finishing eighth. In terms, of, in terms of incident, of all the in teams that participated yeah. in GT3 class. That's yeah. pretty good. So eighth yeah. lowest in incidents, yeah. So I guess I'm phrasing that properly. But um, well, that, that's an impressive feat, you know, when when you're allowed 240 incidents over a 24-hour race and you have less than 30. 29 I mean, incidents. I mean, quite honestly, it wouldn't be inconceivable for somebody to get 29 incidents in one lap <laughs> at Norwich Life. <laughs> Right. I mean, yeah. that's not even a joke. I mean, so that I mean, 24 hours and a couple of incidents like that, you know, were severe and required towing um, and only to be at 29 is amazing. And the standard that everybody should look for. I mean, quite honest. But we've always kind of done that with the Rick Motex and Pit team. We've always kind of been like very low on the incident count. You know, we're good at on that respect, I think. Gentlemen racers. Yes, very much so. Very yeah. much so. Right on. So. Um, other than that, that's about it for me. I can't think of anything else. I've been wanting to do some car craft, but I just didn't get around to it because they've had pretty significant updates, and I've heard, heard it's really good. But um, other than that, that's that's about it. But I know you're you're chomping at the bit, and I'm personally jealous, Sean. I know you talked about it a little bit uh, on Monday's show, but uh, what have you been doing? Ah, me. I, I've been uh... – well, last night, last night I was driving with some friends. We were celebrating Doug's birthday, and we did some radicals at Charlotte, uh, both the Roval and the Oval. Uh, that was fun. So that's the sim racing that I've done since the last show. Um, and it's ironic because I'm going to Charlotte. So I thought that was kind of of all the places, of all the places. Um, and then beyond that, I spent all weekend in the desert, and I was actually at – the Lucky Dog Desert Dash, the Cinco de Mayo Willow Springs event, which, believe it or not, they actually were serving, serving tequila at night on Saturday <laughs> night, which I thought was sort of odd. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, Lucky Dog, it's such a party environment. They're, you know, But it's really funny. 
they have a strict rule. Like, if your mom came to watch you and she popped a beer as a fan, your team just got DQ'd from the race. There is a zero alcohol anywhere in the entire area while cars are racing which i think is pretty cool um i was gonna say that's probably a good idea yeah yeah so yeah i ran another lemons racer lucky dog in this case they're very similar type series and this was two seven hour races seven hours saturday seven hours sunday combine the results for your total and i ran him once again in the volvo um there are two volvos actually a a sedan and a sedan with a turbo and a wagon both of the two series you know volvo goes i don't think this is like total bmw copy but now they'll like refer to them as the two series so all the two tens two forties two there's a bunch of the two series volvos and uh i don't know they seem like they're about the same power the turbo like you didn't hear it you know so when i say turbo don't think psh, <laughs> you know, you know, perfect there we go you no know, this is this is just a it, it had a turbo sure um i don't know i i someone had asked i must have guessed i think they make like 130 horsepower these are really gutless cars um that handle better than anything in the whole series then that's what is so cool about these cars because they're just really fun to drive um, so yeah, we had a really good, uh, weekend there. I mean, I could go on and on, as you know, on Monday, I sort of had motor mouth and just all over the place, motor mouth and, uh, didn't really tell the story per se, I guess. Um, but yeah. Well, what was the end result of both days? The end result of, well, Friday I did get out there and I did practice. So everybody was doing a little, you know, everybody showed up on Friday could do as much as they wanted. I turned six laps in the wagon because I hadn't driven the wagon to double check how accurate my thoughts would be of the track. Because I've, you know, I've driven Willow a lot in sim. So I know all the corners before I got there. I could visualize it at night. And all I wanted to do was see if it really was what I thought it was and judge the car's speed. And in six laps, I had a pretty good feeling and confidence to be able to charge it in race pace. Um, it's only nine corners, so it's, there's not a lot of work right. there. And I'm in a really slow car. Um, so I really brought it in right away. And I thought, you know what? I don't want to hurt or break the car on Friday when we have a weekend of racing. So uh, as soon as I was happy, I came in. Uh, that's what I did on Friday. Saturday, it's kind of funny. You know, this amateur racing. And if you guys think of endurance racing that we've all done together, all three of us have been on the same car, same team. Um, it's that, you know, it's, it's like a Rochambeau or draw straws moment. Who's going to start the car, right? I mean, it's like every time the topic of endurance race comes up amongst the team, the conversation happens, someone will bring it up and then there'll be a moment of silence as though somebody died. Um, <laughs> and so we have eight drivers in two cars and we are splitting up teams and declaring who's going to be the first driver and it's crickets so nobody <laughs> wants to be the first driver no no there's a real reluctance to to jump really? on that and then you know but then there's always somebody who knows that hey i'm willing to so i'm going to step forward because i can see everybody else is chickening out um <laughs> so everybody else takes a step back you know yeah, totally yeah, and you're the you're the one totally. that's outstanding yeah well, thanks for taking the bullet yeah so Friday night, you know, and it's really cool. I don't know any of these people. Uh, Steve is runs in the Lotus, the Chotus team that I've run with. I know Steve very well. Um, I know Gavin, who owns the car, who's not officially one of the drivers. He was sort of like, I'll take somebody's stint if, you know, one opens up. But he wasn't officially going to even drive. Um, the other seven people I've never met before in my life, and they're driving in the car. So we're all kind of like learning, and they're all – 45 to 55 in age it's an older team <laughs> for the most part and uh and not a lot of racing experience either with a lot of them a few of them yes a few of them no so anyway when the topic came up steve volunteered to start in his car and then we all kind of piled behind dave and made him start our car because i think maybe he had the most starts in this type of racing so you by default will start not the not not start to the race, but 
you know, the most races under right. his belt. Yeah. So we made him go, and I was the second driver. Uh, and I'm fine being second. I just didn't want to be first. So um, funny story. We had a plan. The big Volvo, the wagon had a load cell and carried more fuel. So it should get better fuel economy than the turbo, you know, with a littler tank. So we send them both out, and then, and this is so typical to amateur racing, they had a scoring loop, timing loop issue, and an hour into the race, they black flagged the race because timing and scoring wasn't getting anything. So they basically shortened the race by one hour and restarted the race. So Hmm. all the cars went out, and you have to come in every two hours to do a, 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 you have to come in for two hours because when you come in for a pit stop, they give you a five-minute timer. And that's to for safety because they don't want you rushing when it comes right. to refueling right. and changing drivers. So if you're <clears> faster <throat> than five minutes, you just wasted your energy. Um, anyway, every two hours, you have to come in for five minutes no matter what you do, whether you do nothing. I mean, if you had a 50-gallon fuel drum in the back, sure. you still have to come for five minutes. So... Um, <clears throat> At some point, the little Volvo comes in, and we only have enough pit stall for one car, and we have a whole routine of what we had in mind of how it would be done. So the little car comes in, and we're halfway through getting that car turned around, and the other car comes in, and everyone's yelling at him, go, 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 (laughs) and he's just like got his hands up, and everyone's still yelling, and then one guy jumps over the wall and goes over and gets yelling at him, go, well, he was running out of gas, <laughs> and he's like, I cannot go out of the pits empty, right? Like, I'm in because I was running out of gas. Anyway, I was the second driver, so I had to very quickly throw on my helmet to go be part of the fueling team for the second car that's now, like, wrongly in the pits, and then I had to jump back over the wall to throw on, like, my Hans because I didn't have anything on when I, you know, and get ready to go in as the driver, at which point I jumped in and got in the car and went, which meant I didn't get my GoPro for session one, which I'm really upset about. Oh, um, oh I missed one part, qualifying. You guys want the whole story? This I was going to do a recap video. I feel like I'm getting very long-winded. <laughs> well, you asked how it played what out. Was the, yeah, what was the end result? Like, what, what was on Saturday and then Sunday? We were consistently the slowest car on track, okay? Um, so we were fighting for those last five positions based on who was having various different difficulties. And that's pretty much where we spent all of Saturday. Um, and it wasn't, I mean, we had a real big variance in our driving talent too. So, and it really wasn't like a team put together to try to win the race. Like we didn't have a car that was going to win the race. We didn't have drivers that were going to win the race. It was, Hey, you get to drive, you know. I mean, I spent close to three hours on the track this weekend. So I got a lot of, uh, under racing conditions, so I got a lot of track time in a car. Anyway, our car broke with five minutes to go um, at the top of the hill right here. In fact, I have the image, and it's coming off of turn five down the hill, if you guys know Button Willow. Yes. Um, And the left spindle, left front spindle sheared. Well, if you think about the, dynamics of the left front shearing it's going into the one of only two left hand turns on the whole track and if he had broke that spindle a hundred yards later he might even in the volvo be doing well over a hundred downhill doing a right hand turn and to have your left front spindle would equal your left front brake locking up sending you off into the desert in an old Volvo, it could have, it could have been very ugly. Um, anyway, Sounds exciting to me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it broke at that moment. Five minutes to go in the race, and we were out. And it was the kind of part that's really not everyone carries an extra spindle with them. Um, so yeah, that was kind of devastating. And now we're down to one car. So um, yeah, that was Saturday. I got my stint. My stint was fairly impressive for being my second race in this type of car i was driving the wagon not the sedan the wagon's a little different it it hops the rear end a lot but in some ways it's a little more stable it feels because of the weight over the rear end i think 
Um, but I did really well. Did very well in the car. Then so what'd you do Sunday? Yeah. So then Sunday, uh, well, Saturday night we're trying to fix the car. Uh, if you own two Volvo race cars, well, then you're part of the Volvo community, right? And you're in the forums. So the call went out. Anyone know where we can find one? There was a spindle found 100 miles away down in L.A. Somebody drove all the way down there to pick it up and bring it back just to see if that car could get back out on the track. Um, In Lucky Dog, Lemons, any of these kind of racing series, like if you go through like eight hours of repair and get back out, every paddock out there everybody will be applauding like you know it becomes a parade for that car that somehow gets back on the track like that's just the epitome of this kind of racing so it's like do everything you can i mean if we had been able so the spindle came and it didn't fit fit side story i'll come back to the race and uh if even if it had we would have only gotten like maybe one or two hours of track time on day two um also while we were repairing the car trying to figure out diagnose the problem came the new topic of all right now there's eight of us we're all gonna pop dog pile into one car who's gonna start at which point steve says i think sean should start <laughs> <laughs> so i'm like okay i'll start the race so uh day two i did start the race which is good because it meant that i had the time to put on my gopro and get it going which means i do and will be able to show in car footage but there's more to that story even unfortunately um so and i think my gopro is actually running brandon i talked to brandon during the race and told him about forgetting the gopro and he's like well you should turn it on later just to get some in-car footage and i'm like you're right so on the last stint of the day i hit go which means i actually have the failure moment on my gopro as well oh awesome and i'm talking about all this as though i've not seen it right because i haven't seen it i left the gopro on the car um <laughs> <laughs> I drove the, I started the race. So it's a behind the pace car. And, and, you know, even though I've done this in karting where, well, there was no pace car, but the leader would, you know, roll us out standing start usually in those. But I mean, I'm accustomed to starts of races. I've done it a million times in sim racing, but in this one, you know, there's a pace car. Cars are two by two, you know, two wide. And we're all stacked up waiting. The pace car pulls in. The leader is not allowed to go until the green. I can see the green from the back as much as he can from the front. And then it's just a mad dash of, I don't know, there was like at least 50 cars. I didn't get a final count. Holy crap. Um, Yeah, and it's awesome. And there's like one BMW got a bad call. He just comes roaring up the inside past everybody into turn one. And it's like went from 50th to probably 20th. Um, And some people like me were just like doing my thing. I see the car in front. We're too wide. I'm not doing anything yet you know we're gonna sort this out and then we can get down to business so that's what i did i probably gave up a couple positions and then oh and now i'm in the little one which is a little twitchier but maybe a little quicker um and i'm just like really wheeling the car and it what was so satisfying is i'm in this volvo with no horsepower and i would like run down a miata <laughs> which that should not happen. The Volvo should not run down a Miata. And and then like on turn two, which is an uphill right-hander, I could just drive right around the Miata. Um, BMWs that were in like the next class up, I could chase them through too. And they couldn't even get away from me until we got to the downhill long right-hander of eight and even on the front stretch where they could stretch their legs. And then it was just ridiculous how fast some of these cars were. Anyway, uh, in the end, the, the wagon finished the race and i think we finished in like 24th position but they i'd never seen so many cars dnf uh this track was brutal on the cars just yeah you're at you're at wide open birds. yeah and you're at wide open throttle the whole time so the engine and drive line is just being tortured and um, didn't you say sean that this was like the first or pretty close to the first event after repave of that track too yeah they had just re i mean it was a bla- oh, it was repaved. perfect okay. blackness before we got there i mean like it had just like last week had been repaved oh wow and it was ext- it was like a sandpaper type finish it was the most grippy thing and i wonder if you know they their their tagline for willow springs is the fastest track in the west um 
and it is as far as a road course goes. And I think part of it is maintaining these like immense grip levels and a track that's like four cars wide um, and some features that make it a, a, a really perfect track for what we are doing actually because it's relatively safe and there's so much room that even if somebody does do something, you probably have yeah, two you guys, or three options around them. Yeah, you have a lot of room out there. Yeah, so it would... Man, I had such a great time. In some That's way, good. in a lot, of, in a lot of ways, I had more fun than Button Willow because at Button Willow we had a car that wasn't running well, and the only time I got it running well was from what one in the morning to three or two, no, two to four in the morning, and With it was one headlight. Yeah, it, I had, <laughs> <laughs> and and it was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, <laughs> so this was different, um, and it was really really fun. I had a blast. I highly recommend it. I, I really do. I mean, in this grand scheme of things, it cost me a thousand dollars, you know, start to finish, because uh, I camped out of my car, and that is about as cheap as you can get for three hours of racing condition driving. I can't think of a way you could do it cheaper. I just can't. So yeah, it was it was cool. really really cool. I highly recommend it. So that's what I've been doing. Long version. Nice. Long version. Right on. Yeah. So. I guess we covered that we yeah. even though we didn't plan on doing news there were a few news topics that were very worthy of talking about um because they all kind of struck a bone with us but uh i don't know billy this one's you or all of them are you no <laughs> they are <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah just to kick it off today released the dirt rally update so that's the subaru impreza and the ford focus also they updated I think every season or every update they give out or uh, put in some livery choices for other cars as well. Cool. So anyway, that's available for people to go run. I'm going to do it myself later today or early tomorrow and give those two cars a whirl. Probably in, uh, I think I'm going to do Sweden. I don't think I've spent enough time at Sweden yet. So Was Germany part of this or was that uh, no. something they already did? Okay. Germany is in two weeks i gotcha or is it in four weeks i think it's in two weeks did you do okay. monte carlo did we talk about that yep okay did you like it refresher yeah i really like monte carlo it's incredibly challenging especially the longer courses which i really like as you go from a, a tarmac and then up to ice and then to snow or if you're doing the descent obviously it's the reverse of that but I really like the change in conditions. I thought they did a really good job with that. That's right. They, uh, It's a redo, right? So, yes, Monte Carlo, Sweden, and Germany are all, for lack of a better term, reskins from the first dirt rally, which is unfortunate. Now, isn't that, that just included. bad branding? Because we always talk about how sims are built on the platforms of the pr previous sim. For the most part um that's kind of the concept of video gaming in general like you don't build a new map you make it you improve the old map i mean that's a general philosophy of gaming across the board a lot of the time um so i guess redo kind of almost is like a slam like it was nothing more than a prettying up right but i mean don't i mean isn't that what we're yeah, always gonna I, get <laughs> the, for the people that play dirt rally it's it's a problem just because although they did a lot of rework to dirt rally 2.0 it i don't know if that rework necessitated the idea of separating those rallies out because you remember we still have i think it, what is it whales right mm -hmm. uh, so separating those out to add to pay for them to add them in later Yes, like I if the, if these people the wrong way because they already had the original dirt rally, so I like... don't think that's a good. It's just not a good look. However much effort they put into it, I'm not questioning. But from an optics perspective, it's not great. Right. Uh, to to separate something out that you already had before. Like, if those had been included and the ones coming out as DLC had been, like, rallies we'd never seen, 
everyone would be doing backflips and jumping for joy. I think the problem the problem is rally stages often take a lot of work because you do not get a repeating environment, right? So if you ever hear of any other developer like uh, Studio 397, iRacing, all these doing the big tracks like a Nordschleife or even a city circuit that they're trying to replicate is is a big task in and of itself. So I understand that those rally stages take longer to create because you do not get a repeating environment out of that. Sure, each of them the, ends up being half a Nordschleife. Sure, so the, or even pro, a full the thing Nordschleife. I would say, though, is it doesn't matter. Right. I don't care. <laughs> and I know that sounds a little jerkish to say, but the it was already in. Right. And you should not... What should have been done is the old rallies stay, some new rallies added, right? Because that's, yep. I think that's what we've come to expect, not new rallies and then give me the old stuff to pay for. If they wanted to do the old stuff and us not pay for it at a later date like they're doing and have that be not paid DLC, I'd be totally fine with that. Right. Because maybe it was a... They had to have it out at a certain release date, what have you. But that's not what happened. You had to pay. You have to pay for those things that were already included in the first one. And to those people that didn't really run a lot in Dirt Rally or didn't run the first Dirt Rally at all, then this this is a moot point for them because they never experienced it, so they don't know any sure. different. But I would say you're just you were getting shortchanged on the content that was available, and it's it's kind of frustrating because. We still bought it, right? We so in a sense we're saying this is okay to do. Right, right. You're Which advocating it by purchasing it. it. Yep. Because the thing is, is that it's fun enough with all of its shortcomings, it's still fun enough for me to revisit it every two weeks. It's a smart mar marketing strategy, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Uh the you know, it still plays relatively well. It's so it's frustrating because it's like a, I want to support something like this because it's a rally game. We don't get a ton of those, although lately it's been more. Traditionally, we don't get a ton of rally games, especially for the United States. Right. It's often thought of as a market that just doesn't work well for, for rally. So I want to support that. Number two, something that is supposed to be closer to sim, I want to support. Number three, I, they have stuff that I want to drive. Right. So it's frustrating because I, I, I bought it because I wanted to, but I wasn't happy about having to pay for the things that should have been in there to begin with, but I did it. And that's, <laughs> they put you in this box because if you don't buy it, then they're not going to make another one. Right. Right. So it's, it, if it almost feels like they kind of hold it over your head, like, well, like, I know you want this. They're, I know you want it. And they're by, by doing it to a success, they're they're forcing that to be the way it is, right? And and then like you're torn because A, you want it, sure, and B, you want them to succeed to an extent for the future as well. And so it's like, yes, you're it's a you have to abide abide by it unless you want to pick a new sim or a new hobby. Um Right. And so and then the minute you do it, you've endorsed this new standard. Exactly. And, and there's that's no the two ways about, you know, that's it. You don't get around it. You either, you either, and this doesn't apply to the person that is not interested in a sim like, or a sim or a game like this. It's just, I was personally, I was interested in it. I really enjoyed the first Dirt Rally. It had some of its own shortcomings, but overall, I really enjoyed the first Dirt Rally. So I wanted to support, and I was, it was a buy for me already, mm -hmm. right? It was, it was a buy for me. Dirt 4 happened. And it's supposed to be different than Dirt 4. All right, I'm on board. I'm going to I'm going to buy it. Right. But then by buying it, and especially I didn't I know I didn't have to buy that season pass. But you're getting the cars and if you look at what you're paying for regardless of if it was included in the first game, it's not a bad deal. But it was included in the, I don't know. It's frustrating. It's just a frustrating position to be put in as a consumer. 
And, That's fair. You know, I, I don't want to always come back to this topic. That's why I just I kind of lost over. But you bring up a point, and that point is, as a consumer, when any company does this to us, and it's something that we want to do, it's something that we want to participate in and we want to support, you put us in a box that endorses practices that we don't that we don't like right. i could say vote with your wallet and then you'll never get one of these again right right which is the game itself is not terrible it's not sure. awful i'd like to see another one later on down the line so it's not to me it's not like an anthem where the majority i know there there's a player base for it, but the majority of people don't like anthem so that was built up that was built upon bioware's uh legacy and so it kind of put people in the same position they wanted to support bioware and that game unfortunately is garbage they didn't even get a good game out of it in my opinion we at least get a good game out of this right it uh, i don't know maybe i'm just thinking i think about it too much i just i find it, it's just frustrating for me well you know we've had so many in in the retail world we've had different versions of this and i was about to say this as well you know this is kind of the new way and then i'm like well wait look at cars like you know since like 19 i don't know what year cars became a new model for every year but somewhere in the 50s i think is about when it became every year there's a new model and they might do the slightest of changes to make it feel like you're in the old one because you'd see the new one with it might just be a headlight change or a trim kit you know, but sure. you know damn well that's the new one and yours is now the old one. And other than cars, I can't think of a lot of circumstances until the modern era. But, like, look at phones now. You know, phones, they didn't do it. But now it's like, damn right, they have a new phone model every nine months. I don't even think they wait a year now. That's why they don't right. name them after the model years. It's like, oh, S7, S8, S9. And then a lot of times the changes are very incremental. Um, maybe it's just a little bit bigger screen, uh, you know, a couple new features, a faster chip, you know, and, and you're supposed to get caught up in this. So, and I'm not trying to accuse Dirt of doing the exact same thing, but we are getting closer and closer to that with certain titles where it's just... Uh, mm, PC hard, PC yeah. uh, hardware is similar. Yeah. Always TVs. Everything, I mean, we're, yep. You know, we're exposed to this. It's, again... But those feel like a different thing to me. When I buy a TV, that lasts me a long time until I feel like I want to upgrade to the next thing. Right. The Where new model year is not going to... They're going to still you. make another TV. Right. So I don't... If I buy a Samsung or a Sony or a Vizio, what have you, an LG, they're still going to make another TV. And so I can skip these few until I see something that is worth that i feel is worth my dollar in feature wise yeah. to change yeah. to where this isn't like that they're not going to make another dirt rally if this one doesn't get bought right yep so and, and again i'm that's with the caveat that it's actually fun to play if it wasn't fun to play then i'd say burn it to the ground you know they, just, <laughs> they totally you know ripped us off but in my opinion I have fun with it. That's the only reason I return when they release new cars and stuff. I go and try them out again. Yep. If I didn't like it, I wouldn't do that. And you're doing so it because you're consumer, eager to, putting, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So as a consumer, I'm put in this position where I'm endorsing practices that I don't care for because the base game was I enjoy. And I, I'd like, again, once they're done with their cycle in this, I'd like to see them do another one however many years down the line that is. I don't want the, I don't want to see it go away. Sure. You so know, Sean, huh. your cell phone comparison for Dirt Rally is actually, in my opinion, pretty on the mark. Uh, because cell phones, if you look at them, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, we're improving it by taking away your headphone jack or you can't <laughs> replace batteries anymore. But, oh, you know, if you want that feature, this next generation is going to come out with a deal we're going to sell you that you had in the last generation, but now you got to buy it extra. Right. You know, and, and Dirt Rally, I think the biggest, one of the biggest things is, is it kind of feels that way, right? Like you have to get the season pass to get the content that's just a polished up version of to what's already been. everything, exactly. yeah. Exactly. You know, and get the cars that you had before and to get the, the, the new versions of what you had in the first game. And I think, in my opinion, 
the biggest rub, and and I wasn't huge into the original Dirt Rally, but the biggest rub seems to be is that, you know, it had bugs, it had issues. The original Dirt Rally did, um, but I think people just wanted those little things fixed, and they wanted more content. The the hardcore fan yes. base that yeah. drove those rally stages into the ground, right? You know, that's what they wanted. They just wanted something to freshen it up, to breathe new life into the game. And I think the biggest rub for this title is, is like, oh, yeah, here's your new title. Oh, wait, it's pretty much at this point just a sparkly, shiny coat on what you already had before. And now you got to buy it twice. Well, well and, and a little more salt in the wound when you think the number one community request from Dirt Rally 1 would be more content. So here's less content. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know polished less content and it's like wait we didn't need polish we needed more content um you know i yeah i, I yeah i agree i yeah, agree it's a shame but and they're not the only go ahead i was gonna say it's a shame but i'm i'm happy they're coming out with these cars that this era i really like and then obviously mm-hmm. the mccray era before that you know early yep. 2000s late 90s the kind of one of the you know, there's obviously eras of rally that are pinnacles, and that's one of those for me. Yeah, I'd, they're not the only ones to do this. You know, Forza Motorsport had done this before. I don't think they really do it anymore. I think they've gotten better about it, right? If I remember right, could be wrong, but I do remember that they did this before, and it was the same thing. You would pay for a car, but you couldn't race it. When you paid real world money for it, yet you couldn't race it. You had to earn the, and then in-game credits to drive the thing that you already paid real-world money for. It's like, okay, this is no longer part of the game. I actually handed you dollar bills for this thing, and I can't. So they eliminated that. But this is not a new concept. It's been done in other titles. Right. You can look at a myriad of sports titles and other games, period. It's just it's frustrating on this end. But I, I, I'm... I'm still going to do it. I'm yeah. still going to. It's still an awesome game. Here, I'm still, yep. I'm all still of its faults, all of its focus. flaws. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, you can make the same argument with iRacing, not in the same manner of the monetization scheme, but just the fact that, oh, they just came out with blank and I could rally against it and say I'm not going to do it. But uh, eventually, I end up buying it. Right. Yep. Despite so, all of its it, faults and all of its yep. flaws. <laughs> oh, no. You know, it's no, it's no different, I guess, in that. In that regard, pardon me. Sure. sure. So not to derail the news here, but I kind of, from this topic, it, it made me think of something that I wanted to ask you guys. So, Bill, you talked about the marketing strategy of this and the fact that every two weeks or a month or whatever, they have a new event, right? And they've tried different iterations of this with, like, leaderboard challenges and different things and different sims, right? But the way the dirt aspect is working I wonder how well that would work if, say, another Codemasters title like Formula One did the same thing and they corresponded it with the real life events. So say you had, you know, Malaysian GP or Australia or whatever coming up and they said, okay, two weeks before, here's your pack. Here's, you know, your Melbourne track. Here's your times, you know, go out there and and see what you can do. It's a dangerous proposition because what that would be based upon what they were willing to segment to begin with. If we're talking about um, segmenting out tracks and you didn't get those to begin with, can you imagine the uproar? I mean, yeah. people are already upset that the there's not a full uh, two schedule in it because we're getting the the two cars. Mm-hmm. In Formula One, so can you that imagine kind of similar like the first Sorry. three, or five tracks, and then you got to pay for the other ones? See, I'm, you know, and this know. this goes back a long time, all the way back to West Brothers, which is long before I was a streamer or any kind of a you know YouTuber or anything. Um, I am willing, or would be willing, to pay obscene amounts of money if it was mind blowing. But the problem for me is when you get to mind blowing, now you're talking, forget VR. I don't think our computers could run mind blowing. Mm-hmm. Um, so like last night we were racing at Charlotte and somebody was like, Oh, there's Dale Earnhardt, you know, cause he's one of the spectator looking guys. 
And it's oh, like, okay, yeah. And it's like, no, that's more like 7,000 Dale Earnhardt because there's only like five or six humans <laughs> modeled, right, as a group. But, you know, and it's like little details like that. Not, you know, it's obscene, like, how much detail could be put into something is what I'm getting at. And I would pay for it. But, again, our computers aren't going to run it because if that really was, like, unique-looking individuals and, and, you know, it, it would just be so much memory uh, that it would be too much. Um, but if we were talking about that kind of a difference, I would pay 50 bucks for this week's track, getting back to what you said, Brandon, about Codemasters uh, with F1 2000. What if, you know, next week's track, you know, was, uh, um, you know, Bahrain, I'd pay $50 for this, like, mind-blowing version of Bahrain. But mm-hmm. since it's just another track at the level that we're currently getting everything we get, I'm not feeling is generous and then when it's a game that's short on content like billy i'm like well wait this was in the game before i'm i'll pay you again i'll come back to my i'll pay you how about you build another rally fantasy or not they're all fantasy to an extent right i mean so i don't care what you want to call it or where it is in the world but give me another rally and charge me five bucks ten bucks whatever you want to charge and i'm all in um but give me enough to play so that I'm not bored waiting on your next rollout. Kind of how I feel about AC, but not as extreme, you know, because it's like, well, one car, one track, what am I going to do? I literally played it for an hour and a half, and I was done. Okay, here's your second car, second track. All right, I'll play it another hour and a half, (laughs) you know. And now, I mean, I'm looking forward to the 29th and playing the full version, and maybe I'll start putting it to more of a weekly-type use in some circumstance, but... It hasn't been a fun process, I don't feel, <laughs> you know. Well, I, and I think that we've crossed over, crossed the bridge over into a, an area where if you back up and take a more global look at the industry, kind of already happens, right? Madden, uh, NHL games, MLB games, soccer, so all FIFA. The, yeah, all the sport titles. Uh, but also... Good example, what Brandon brought up is the F1 games. People often make the argument that I'm just getting the same thing except you're adding or taking away one little thing and you're making the graphics a little prettier. Does that justify another $60 purchase? Right. And for a lot of people, it doesn't. <clears throat> Pardon me. Huh? It doesn't. <laughs> so it's kind of the same argument, but it's separate. Right. Right as what we're talking about with dirt rally 2.0 and i guess it just comes to the value of the person that's purchasing whatever it is does is it worth it sure to them right so i'll I'll give you a great example though like i'm a huge premier league soccer fan all right i should call it football because you know but i watch a lot of premier league so i know who's on what team and i know where the teams are from and i know them by their jerseys so when I'm playing a FIFA game, it's fairly important that it be current because if the right. branding of the stadium isn't right, it doesn't look right to me. I know what it's supposed to look like. Um, and same thing with the player names. Like, I don't want to play against a guy who's been traded to another team. It annoys me when it's a sport I care a lot about or know a lot about is even better. Not care, but no. Now, Go to basketball, where I've kind of lost touch on basketball. I don't even know who plays basketball anymore for the most part. I could play a three-year-old version. It wouldn't matter. Not one bit. If As long as it's fun and the graphics are current enough to keep me appealed you know, uh, uh, you know, know, or, or impressed, I'm good. It's not critical. But again, on title. Now, we're racing fans. If a driver changes teams or a team changes liveries or they do something extreme with the wing or with the halo or in the case of f1 where they change one or two tracks each season um it is kind of critical you know when they go to what what's the two german hockenheim and nurberg don't they alter those two each year um i won't say for sure because i don't remember i think that's the two that get rotated just as an example for the german grand prix um it's kind of critical that and have the right one, you know, if you're a big sport, you know, guy. We, we I, I always say it, we want to do on Sunday what we – or Monday what we watched on TV on Sunday, you know, and the more we can make it like, the better. So wouldn't the argument then be 
that for it would be a, a better idea as a game of a ser- games for a service that when a new roster comes out, we'll talk about the football game. When a new roster comes out, different, maybe they changed uh, a particular color on the jersey, what have you. Wouldn't you want that in an update rather than another $60 product? So pay $10 for the update, not enough, but yes. they know people are going to buy it. So that's not the option that they're going to give you. Yes, I totally but agree. Wouldn't, I mean, if there's going to be a graphical update, okay, maybe it's 15 or $20 now to get that next update. But the problem is, is that they know people are going to buy it. So in a different manner than Dirt Rally, you're still as a consumer put in another box. Right. They were doing it with the NASCAR Heat Series. Sure. They were doing different skins for different races throughout the year, and you would buy a skin pack, another skin pack, and they're yes. like 10 bucks for skins. Yes. And I'm just like, that's extreme. That's NASCAR to- pricing. <laughs> <laughs> right? But for when next year you're going to bring out another NASCAR Heat game, and you're going to have basically yeah. most of those skins available, I, I don't. It's, it's hard because – you as a fan of the particular, especially when we, it's a correlation between real life, these sports games, whether it's motorsports, football, hockey, baseball, whatever. We have a connection to those things. And like you said, we want to play something that we, to a degree, is authentic. Right. And we're willing to pay for that. But it's only because the game developer and the publisher have put us in that particular box. They've said, well, we know you're going to pay $60 anyway. We know you're going to do it. And guess what? We're going to give you microtransactions as well. So not only are you just getting (laughs) next year's content, we're also going to charge you for every different variation that is in there. And And maybe even variations you got for free in the past. (laughs) Oh, God. That can go in a whole other direction where – you know, things used to be unlocked for winning in something or completing something. You know, you got, I mean, remember playing racing games back in the day where things were locked away and Mm -hmm. then once you beat something, you got it. Mm -hmm. Like that was a reward. That used to be some of my favorite things was working and striving to finally, I mean, I know we go back to Gran Turismo, but that was one of my first exposures to this type of thing where, you had to get all golds in the in the license tests, and then you got all those special cars. Yep, they'd make and, you pay for that. And it was they, they, reward cars were a big big deal. And a oh, big, the four hundred. I remember uh, the four hundred R was. Yeah, and it's a I big was also oh, a yeah. perk. Oh, that was awesome. Yes, is it? And it's yeah. A big, yeah. I, How dare you bring up uh, you know reward achievement based sort of uh, right <laughs> gameplay versus you know consumerism and you know, the, the sense of spending money gives you satisfaction. Well, people often bring up the argument about the car PG thing anymore, because that's what Gran Turismo and Forza are. They were car PGs. Yeah. That's what I call them. Yeah. And the argument for not doing that anymore is, well, people don't have time. People don't care. Well, when you don't place any value on anything, do you think the consumer then finds an investment? They're invested in your product? Right. When yeah. when Forza came out with being able to skip levels, when that you know because you have a driver level, when you could pay to skip levels, and it's just like well for those people that don't have time, I always felt like do you not have faith in your product? That, that they'd spend the time. They're not entertained. That, that, you know that they're not entertained enough. <laughs> yeah, or did you do something that you know that well we either artificially lengthened the time it takes, or this might not be that good. So, you know, if you want to pass it, pay us some money. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, you know, they, they, and this is not new again. Assassin's Creed, several games have done this throughout the years. And I always feel like, do you, are you not confident in your product when you do this? People argue all day long. Well, you don't have to do it. I know I don't have to do it. But don't you think there is a reason they're not doing this out of the goodness of their heart. There's <laughs> right. a reason that they're doing this. And they've either artificially extended the time that it takes to complete to get to the next thing or they just want the, the the product isn't as good as they'd like it to be so let's just give me more money give you more money and then you can skip all this <laughs> right yeah <laughs> so i yeah 
it's food for thought. And it, I guess it all boils, you know, comes full circle to buyer beware. You know, you, well, yeah. you want to support a certain type of thing. Just do your research. And it's what it's worth to you, right? There are several people that go ahead and buy those extra microtransactions to skip the thing to go on. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, I could see both sides. In yeah. in World of Warships, a game I haven't played in ages, I've been dying to get back to World of Warships. Whoops, I changed things. I don't want to. Um, they have a, a lot of free content. Like you don't have to pay a dime to play that game and play it a lot and play it deep into its career. Um, but if you pay money and you are a premium member, then you get more experience points in battle, so you get to those rewards or levels right. quicker. Um, and then you can buy content, which is usually a lot prettier, but no better. In fact, it sometimes is even inferior on a military level, but it looks super cool. So you might want to spend money because they're gorgeous compared to the free ones. And the free ones are totally awesome. There's nothing right. wrong with them. They look great. But the, the pay boats are just highly, highly detailed and awesome. Yeah. Um, now... If you go into a ranked battle where you need to be a certain level and you show up with a bot boat, everyone clowns your ass because they're like, oh, you bought your way into this level. So even if you had yeah, the level. Yeah, the developer has done that by doing pay to win. Yeah, and even if you had acquired that level but you owned a premium boat because you were aficionado or had appreciation, they're still going to clow you because the assumption is that you bought your way in. And nobody in the know dares show up and do a premium battle with a paid boat, you know. And anyway, it's 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 yeah. it's the only time where I've seen paying actually haunts you, um, because you know now you look like one of those. You've been labeled right. as one such. Of those people. Yeah. So. <laughs> to circle back real quick before we go on to the next story, we did Brandon did mention the whole, you know, the two week update for Dirt Rally and that kind of thing. There was a game that on the Wii U, I think it's on the Switch now too, for Nintendo, and it was called Splatoon. And they strategically moved, took away, and then added modes to create that buzz right. to get more people participating in one particular thing than everybody spread out all over. Right. And it was met with initially a lot of resistance, but what it ended up doing was it put the player base more together and it caused every time they had, I don't remember how often it updated, but every time it did update, there was some sort of buzz about the game. And then everybody went to the new mode because that mode wasn't in there yep. before or whatnot. Yep. And so it's, you know, I, again, now they're taking, it was kind of like they took something away. I think in other modes it didn't, but I think in the competitive online play, they, they were like only selecting certain modes that you could do and then they would rotate them in and out. Right. So again, you know, is that something that I, I don't know? I don't know how to feel about a system like that. Now that's a little different in that if it breeds to more participation, because they're 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 steering the flock, right? And instead of letting the flock just kind of go open range, they're kind of keeping them corralled and going in a path so that the numbers are always. But like when World of Warships, an, an example to parallel that. One April, about four years ago, they switched to tugboats. You know, it was like an April Fool's joke. <laughs> and it was in a bathtub. And That's hilarious. And when you shot the guns, there was like boink, you know, and made cartoon-type noises. That's funny. Um, it was packed. I mean, like, all these dudes who are like hardcore, like Navy dudes, retired Navy dudes playing War of War, <laughs> are now playing tugboat. And it was packed every night that they had that going on. That's funny. Um, and they've done other things where they had like specific campaigns where it's like a co-op, but it's like, hey, special thing we're gonna do. Uh, uh, oh, it was for the movie. Um, Battleship. No, no, the the English the the private boats came and saved everybody. Um, from England, hmm. they went to France. Yeah, and... what you're saying to me right now is things and stuff and words, and I don't, I have no <laughs> idea. What to me about. either. It was a movie about when England was helping France against Germany in World War II, I think. 
and Not a clue. their navy got wiped out. So a bunch of private boats came from England across the channel to pick up all the sailor sailors to get them home. You could tell me this happened yesterday, and I still wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, they had a whole uh, mission that was going along with that movie that they had, oh, okay. they had uh, put. And it was packed, same thing. But they were using these taking away and giving modes as a way of corralling the numbers, which I, I wish iRacing would do. Because my most frustrating thing, and this kind of is similar to what we're talking about, is that they have so much going on that you can't find – big numbers except for just a couple of series yeah so all right any more on that you guys i think we're good yeah all right moving right along this is kind of cool um are we gonna call this hearsay or is this fact i'm not 100 percent sure when you can call things no yesterday i racing supremo they call him tony gardner confirmed that the audi now this isn't my word so that's why i'm gonna say it's oh well here's a post from tony gardner I yeah. guess you... No, there was a post. We just <laughs> yeah. find the flipping post because uh, iRacing uh, posts things in the forum and nowhere else. <laughs> so the way to let everybody know is obviously to post this in the forum instead of, you know, in some sort of official capacity that we can then let everybody know for those that are interested. So this is cool, though. This is the Audi RS3 LMS TCR. It looks awesome. Basically, it looks it's a touring really cool. car. It is a, yeah, it is a drink car, yep. Yeah, which, um, and and knowing iRacing, especially lately in this time, I can only imagine there'll be three or four touring cars, I hope, to go along with it. That would be super cool. Um, they haven't named anything, but you never know. Well, they do have licensing deals with other teams that participate. Well, they've struggled, they've struggled a long time to actually get a, an actual touring car into the Sims. So this is their first foray, and it, so it wouldn't surprise me if this is the only car it becomes like a one make series until they can right. get other teams on board. Right. Maybe like the Camel series. That car on your shirt right. was that considered a touring car if it was in modern era? Or th- those are two door, huh? Yeah, Grand Touring. Yeah, it would be. This would be more of a GTO. Well, open. it was. It was in the GT. It was a GTO. Okay, yeah. GTO. There you go. Yeah, I think that's a grand touring open. All right. So I, I have no idea. They say ready for a June, but it will not be ready for the June build, maybe a mid-season release. So, well, I mean, look at the imagery. But modeling is totally separate from physics, and the, you know. Um, right. So we are looking at models. But, yeah, it could be soon. It could be, they're saying, mid mid this year. No, that's exciting. I know a lot of people want the touring car stuff, and I, I'm interested in it. I think, I think the car looks really cool. Well, like, I like the V8 supercar a ton, so visually it resembles that type of shape. Um, but the V8 supercar is such a nightmare to drive. <laughs> well, <laughs> so uh, maybe this will be a little bit more uh, uh, drivable in a in a car shape that I like. Because, again, I, well, I believe these are front-wheel drive. I do like when cars resemble cars you can actually buy. Like, I like yeah. that in racing in general. Um, you know, and that – Looks pretty darn close. I mean, you could do, you could make your street Audi look like that if you really wanted to. <laughs> yeah, have some fender flares. Well, and hopefully the racing lives up to you know previous titles that we've had, which I know Billy and I have talked about this ad nauseum. Not particularly on the show, but you know, in private conversation. But like Toka, the Toka franchise, especially the original and Toka Two, for me, that's a real soft spot. You know, kind of tugs on my heartstrings. I love touring car racing. Uh, it's, Great show they put on. Great games. Yeah. Well, it's sort of. I loved watching those touring cars. Yeah. It it becomes like sort of the NASCAR of road racing, you know, where it's door to door and fender to fender Mm -hmm. and and the drivers are not shy with each other. (laughs) Well, same thing. I mean, the the Australian supercars are basic or a touring car in a sense. Yeah. So, I mean, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, They also did. I don't know if they confirmed it again. It's real hard to understand, but we. In the June build, they do say that the the Pro 2 and Pro 4 trucks are coming. So, cross my fingers. I I can't wait to try one. And and so, and additional tracks will be added. So, it looks like iRacing is planning to release these new vehicles and tracks in its next quarterly update scheduled for June. Additional tracks will be, because that's what the first thing, it's like, we talked about the trucks, 
But what I really haven't heard is where are we going to race the trucks? I think they did say it. I don't remember that. That initial post was clear back in March, but I think they reiterate again. It was hard. It's so incredibly difficult to find where this was said in the forums. But I do believe they reiterated that point that they should be ready in the June uh, build. Yeah, and I think with the trucks, they're supposed to come with two initial tracks, if I remember I reading correct. that correctly. Yeah, okay. I can't remember where they were, but it was supposed to be two tracks. And then, obviously, they'll you know be able to sell you more shortly after. Uh, let's see here. Two iconic uh, Wild West Motorsport Park and Wild Horse Pass Motorsport Park. Does that sound real? I believe those are. Um Think of where, uh, where are those? Seen some, some south, conversation. Like Google so, it. <laughs> yeah, right. We have the amazing technology. Well, while somebody's googling, the last little piece of news we have in just the news section is talked about the VRC modding team. So not the radio controlled stuff, but the actual VRC modding team posted a teaser, a preview of their project eight the bradley project eight which we all know what that's supposed to be but we're not gonna say it looks cool <laughs> I, I love this car uh i've tried other versions done in a set of course and they always kind of i don't know don't quite measure up so i'm hoping this gets done uh well I, fingers crossed oh look at that definitely Lamar. looking forward to it they're yeah, they're at Lamar. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> All right, that's cool. That's cool. Um, what else we have to talk about today? Oh, this is cool. So we've talked about this a few times, but World of Outlaws. Um, Billy, they just ran at Eldora around seven. We watched it. What are your thoughts? We're getting into the season now, and well into the season. Um. How is this comparing to other esports you think we watch and see? As far as we talk about entertainment value, we talk about esports success and failures, and it's going to take excitement. It's going to take some things that we don't have in real life, but we do have other opportunities they don't have in real life. But what do you think of this race and what's been going on with World of Outlaw stuff? I would say that, you know, last week was Kokomo. We, we didn't talk about it last week. We're talking about it this week. Just because I am pleasantly surprised at how much better the driving standard is, and that's partly due to the way that you have to get in this time versus last time. But I really enjoy, and I know we could talk about my bias to dirt racing, but I really <laughs> enjoy watching the races. They've they're always entertaining. I mean, Kokomo was awesome. A little bit of door bang, you know, wheel banging out on the track but really i mean you've got to figure how car hard these cars are to drive and on that little tight quarter mile from last week and then we go to the half mile out of eldora where they're going three and four wide and tim ryan ends up winning it did a great job that's really good for his season because he's had a terrible season basically up to this point been caught up in several different things or had to come from the back of the b get to the a just hasn't had a lot of luck well he ends up winning it but the action throughout the field and on the restarts, especially the initial start. I mean, they were going three and four wide. Even when somebody, uh, there was a point at the beginning of the race where I don't remember the person's name. They got tagged in the tail tank, kind of shot down the track on the back straightaway. Everybody still held together and they kept whoop, kept racing. I touched the microphone stand. And I think that's partly due to, you know, some of the updates that they've done, especially to the dirt and the way the track starts out and widens out but it was it's so nice to a see these guys trying multiple grooves even though a lot of those guys are still up at the top of the track they're still have some way to get around there that's competitive that's not everybody freight training in the same line right and i just i find this it's short lots of action i i don't it's just and this may be a case of you maybe i only like it or maybe we only like it because we know how difficult these cars are to drive maybe for somebody that hasn't tried this maybe it doesn't hold the same appeal it's just a bunch of cars going around in circles that look like they're all over the place 
Uh, so I don't have it from that perspective. All I can give the perspective from is somebody that has raced all the different cars that iRacing has to offer in these pro series. This is the one that I, I watch every week. Right. I, I watch it every week. I try to catch a NASCAR peak, you know, the peak and free stuff. I try to, to catch the, um, the Porsche races, but they don't always hold my interest. So it's more like in passing or if I, I'll watch a highlights thing or something like that, where typically I've watched, I think it's for this week because I was doing the recording last night. I either watch them live or I watch the full, the full race. Cause even the heat races and the, the, the B mains are exciting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, again, could be my dirt bias. That's fine. Uh, but I've only got my, my perspective. But I think you're really, you know, right on. Cause I mean, like right now we've been watching the race rewind from Eldora on iRacing, uh, the YouTube page, their YouTube videos. And, and exactly as you've been describing, what are we watching? We're watching two, three, four wide, highly competitive racing that is not just a cluster mess, you know? Um, and, and the thing, when I see four lines simultaneously racing, and it's like I might see on TV, it, it, it's kind of a testament to me to the overall physics of the sim because it's not easy to make a track handle that close with multiple lines it's one thing to have a perfect driving line you know like the ai right. would yeah. drive so to speak the ribbon you want to run but having it so that it just pays off because anybody who's watched world of outlaws when you see that inside car come off the corner just a touch ahead but then that outside car comes around with so much speed he's like got the front wheels in the air almost and and comes roaring back to almost go into the next corner ahead you know but it's like exactly and if you watch horse rate you know it's the long way around you know, you can get a oh, little yeah. faster because you don't have to turn as sharp, but it's the long way around. You're putting more miles on the tires than on the car. So I just, I love it. It just, to me, it just, it really emulates real life as well as any form of sim racing that I've seen. Um, and I think that most people haven't tried it because myself included probably take for granted how hard not only these cars are, but that style of racing because it takes a whole different education on where you need to be to be next to somebody but not running into them. You know, when mm -hmm. on, on a standard oval, I know, hey, if I'm here, he's there, we're going to hold our line, everything's cool, because we're kind of relatively pointed forward the whole time. But if he's like this and I'm like this, it's a whole lot different, you know? Um, so, yeah, I just those drivers are amazing to me, and, and I think people underestimate how hard those cars are to drive. Um because if you've not done it before, it's it's a different type of drive, that's for sure. Yeah, so Oops, you know, I just I wanted to say give a give an attaboy to not only iRacing, but also on the the commentators do a pretty good job of keeping it exciting and entertaining. The drivers are doing a good job uh, keeping it. I mean, it's it's as clean as you can make it, in my opinion. You're gonna have contact. These it's it's a, these are short tracks, high horsepower cars. They don't go straight, and then and then the eye racing for giving them the conditions to have a race like this play out. So, rather than always sounding like we're being negative, uh, this was just a point of positivity that I think they're I think they're doing a really good job. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You know, and to that point, Billy, I agree with you. I, I was kind of thinking I was going to say the same thing. But to that point, you got to give credit to the community also because they were so vocal about getting dirt racing and, and iRacing in the first place. Finally got yeah. them to do it. And then once it got there, they didn't re you know rest on their laurels. They didn't say, okay, cool, we got it. Let's just put deal with what we have. Very vocal. And dirt racing, dirt oval in iRacing is – been under constant revision improvements optimizations to where they've got a pretty awesome package it seems it's like pretty good we could always find things for them to improve you know there are things with those cars that i still think need to be implemented that aren't in there but for the package they currently have and the way it performs and the way these drivers are racing everything i i think they're doing I think they're doing a good job. 
a good thing. And, and just so you guys know, Wild West Motorsports Park is in Sparks, Nevada. Okay. That's how okay. And was... Wild Horse Pass Motorsports Park is in Chandler, Arizona. Yeah, okay. So I was I was right. I didn't think they were in California, but I couldn't remember. So are the trophy truck courses fixed courses? Those two are. So I think this it's it's the Lucas Oil series. I think it used to be torque or they're paralleled. Um, so it's it's short course racing, I think is what they call it. So yeah. um, it's it's not like a a trophy truck style Baja 500 or, you know, the Mint 400 or any of those style races right, that are out. Off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it's it's short course, cool stuff, which kind of lends itself. And I hope, I really hope that they can kind of bridge that gap and maybe even do some of the things like the Stadium Super Truck Series and, you know, run us at, at an oval and put some dirt on it, you know, maybe use a rally cross course and add a few extra jumps and, I was going to say, I don't see one. why they wouldn't be able to run on the, the rally cross yeah. tracks. Yeah, so. you're right. Those should be right away available. And, and can you also imagine running the rally cars on a track like that? Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Track. That'd be so great. Um, getting back to the dirt oval work that they've been doing and all the dirt work at iRacing, I think that's also what led to being able to see rally cars and trucks was the fact that they you know really mm -hmm. got it together with their dirt handling model. Um, Billy, is, I see three of the guys in the top 10 in the standings are from Australia. Is Australia. Are, are well, sprinkler racing is big in Australia. Huge. That was my yeah. question. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Australia, in Australia. Australia, New Zealand. Yeah. Australia, New Zealand, and the United States are probably going to be primarily where all of them uh, come from. So. Yeah. And then Canada, but I figured they're the same as us, really. Uh, Canada. Yeah. Well, yeah. Canada has a few tracks uh, osh weekend is probably the most known i think that's how you say it uh, but that i think that's the most known one in the dirt world as far as up north like that right. uh yeah i yeah, and just imagine when those guys have to run what time it is over there versus the time it is over here yeah really <laughs> how do you, how do you tomorrow. get that participation yeah, yeah it's already yeah, tomorrow split. morning no there's there's they've got a huge community down there in australia new zealand area that that they they host uh, they have a lot of leagues and they're those guys are fast mm -hmm. they're all they'll all all of them are fast there's kind of funny nick uh i think it's nick cooper is in there yeah. and we were one we were we were testing when the the 305s when i racing first started putting it together him and I were in there testing, and it was pretty fun. We were running Williams Grove, trading slide jobs with the, just the 305s back then. So it's it's cool to see people like that in it. Awesome. All right, next topic here is VRC, and this time we mean virtual RC, I think is the best way to put it. Virtual RC. Program. Yeah. Um, I just have their website up because, oh, last week we had that whole discussion about sims and i jokingly said we should stop calling them sims we're really playing a game get over it you know um and and i you know i was half-heartedly serious about that um so here's vrc and i think about vrc being a sim of a sim let me rephrase that using last week's terminology vrc is a game of a sim <laughs> it's, a, it's a sim sim yeah. of a sim and that RC could be, in fact, a truer sim than sim racing, of real-life racing. Dun. And so now my real chain is that it's a game of a sim of real life. <laughs> yes, that's what it is. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I... I, first, I heard it here first, folks. <laughs> so my first question, I want both of you guys' answer on this, is RC, forget virtual RC for a second. RC radio control racing is it sim racing or is it real racing and if it is sim racing if it's real racing then hey it's real racing if it's sim racing a simulation of really racing is it more of a sim than sim racing so that, that that's my big question to you guys as I think of VRC pro which I'm going to get a copy of immediately so we can all play this is like an enigma wrapped in a conundrum. That's right. Uh, do you want to go first or would you like me to, Billy? 
Uh, if you have a formulated thought, go ahead, because I'm not I'm not sure how to answer this one yet. Okay, so for me, it's kind of like a lot of things in life, and and where debates come up on this stuff, and the fact that it's mostly perspective. So it's it's what's your definition of simulation versus real life racing is. So if competition is your definition of racing of, of real life racing then you can get that with anything you know billy had a slot car shop they had real races um i used to race rc cars when i was younger billy also did that was real racing you know bicycle racing um even sim racing or or real cars you know what we define as a generic is real racing if it's what your body is physically exposed to um, the physical conditions, the stuff that you have to endure while you're racing a real car, uh, heat, G-forces, stress, you know, environmental factors, then really everything outside of being in an actual car in those environments is some form of analog, there is you know, some sort of substitute for the real thing. Um then you could even kind of break it down and go, okay, you know, the old NASCAR guys back in the day, and, you know, we bring up NASCAR a lot because we're American and that's what we've grown up with. But, you know, they'd have to wear multiple fire boots on one foot just because the exhaust from the car would actually burn their feet, burn the shoes off their feet. Their pit crew members would have to pull them out of the cars because they had sweat so much during the race and in the heat that they would be physically drained. How do you compare that now to a car that has a cool suit and airflow, power steering, you know, all of these basically comforts compared to other forms of discipline, you know, different races that you can get. So I think it's a perspective. I think for me, uh, RC racing is very much real racing, just like in a way sim racing is real racing because for me, it's about the competition. I would say, yeah, the competitive aspect is always, I think that's partly why we do it, right? The competitive aspect is always there. I mean, I'll, I, I ran track and cross country. So Sean's raced bicycles. So it, the competitive aspect is always there. I think maybe the idea would be to break them down into possibly like different scenarios. And what I mean by that is, when you're racing an RC car, when you're playing with an RC car in the real world, that's real physics. There's actual real physics going on there. Where when you're doing simulation, uh, sim racing, it is somebody's best interpretation. And I don't mean interpretation as in a pejorative. I'm just saying that you, there are elements that are not tangible yet in a calculation. Sure. So in that respect, which one is the more sim part is if the idea is to simulate a real, a life-size car going around the track, well, then either one's a simulation because the RC car is a car. It has four wheels, it has gears and a motor, and you steer it around a course What's the difference between virtually using a steering wheel and pedals? It's your control methods just different. So I guess it just depends on your, I don't know how to answer. This is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I do, it's, it's such a, it's an intriguing question for me. It's an interesting question. And I just don't know how to put it because part of me says, well, yeah, you could consider it sim racing. But then part of me says, well, no, because sim racing is more about the actual environment being simulated in a way that you can't do in the real world. You know, there's there, you've got those intangibles that they just kind of have to fill in the blanks where our C cars, you have, you still have, I mean, my brother is sponsored by Associated. He races for Team Associated. And you look at the development of those cars is just as much as some of the real, uh, you know, real racing. They, the, the Fox body shocks they have now with 
and we've had different weights and pistons for shocks and this that's been years 11's car is no cheaper than an rc or <laughs> no more expensive right? than an rc so well i remember <laughs> my dad tells the story when he started racing rc cars he saw them out at a mall they did parking lot races with a board track you know the boards lined the track yeah and he talks and he says I'm watching this guy and he's my dad was currently racing sprint cars, but he just couldn't race every weekend. And so he talks about watching this guy up there. He's just smoking the rest of the field. He comes in for a pit stop and literally smokes a cigarette and then takes off again. I think these were RC 100s, if I'm not mistaken. That's the original or one of the original nitro powered eight scale RC cars. Okay. And they were pan cars, I believe, so they didn't have suspension. They had a solid rear axle. And this guy's just going out there and wiping the floor with everybody else. And my dad looked at that and said, his competitive instinct kicked in. It looks like a car. You know, back then they had these cool Corvette and bodies and uh, the 917, the, the Can-Am car uh -huh. was the open cockpit. That was the body to have. I don't know if they were quite then yet, but I know when I was racing, when I was seven or eight those were the bodies to have because they performed really well so it's simulated right it looks like a real car it's got all these setup and you know they were limited back then but it had setup options so he could it, tire size mattered uh width mattered gearing mattered all these little things and my dad could actually he made his own templates and changed pieces on the car <laughs> which is what he was doing he fabbed his own sprint car uh -huh. so the parallel in that is the same in the manufacturing in the real world physics so but is it's are you trying to simulate or emulate sitting in the car real racing well yes I, I don't know how to answer it. It's, such, <laughs> it's so bizarre. I've never oh. thought of it that way. So, like, when I'm playing the when I'm playing the you know the VRC Pro, I don't really think about is this a sim, or is this a game, or am I simming a sim of a game, or what you know? Like, I I just maybe it's because I raced RC cars. I don't think of it that way. This is just racing RC cars, just virtually. Right. <laughs> right. So I don't know. Congratulations, I, I Sean! You broke Billy. I, you did. This you, is, you this broke is my wonderful. Brain on this one. Well, well, <laughs> it goes even deeper for me because I, you know, in listening to you guys answer the question, I think to one more step. So, what if the next change in RC was that you were forced to drive by the first person view and use like a goggle set or a monitor, and even better, all of a sudden That'd they start awesome. mandating a steering wheel and pedals instead of a trigger and little wheel. There's so, one problem with that. Uh huh the speed the yeah think about the scale miles per hour that you're doing and trying to react that quick not being right. able to survey the same way especially like off-road would be in not that it couldn't be done it would just be incredible incredibly difficult and the reason i say that is because in vrc you can do that you can actually change the control method and you can actually sit in the car right and so you could do that what if they slowed it down in real life? Like, they're like, okay, well, this has to be the way. So, because if they slowed the car down enough to where the scale fit the view, it would be boring to watch, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but to drive, would how much more of a real than sim racing would RC racing now be? I think the problem you'd run into there is the amount of traction that the cars would provide. You'd really have to... You'd have to whole scale change everything because then you're running into an issue of it's kind of the same thing with slot cars. If you were to build a scale 30 second of a track, right. right, and make them go scale speeds, you basically never lift. Right. Because the cars were engineered for a a different purpose, just like RC cars. They have been engineered for a whole other purpose. So with the way they are now, with the scale speeds being so high, you know, you have to work at it. If you slowed everything down, you might run into a situation where you just foot to the floor and you just kind of barely turn around the corners and that's right. it. 
So, I yeah. wonder if there's a crossover point. Sorry, Sean, but I wonder if there's a crossover point where you could actually adjust because I know when we did our SRS races, we kind of do car choices to to change things up diametrically. So it wasn't like you're running slow cars back to back. We'd go something really slow, like the old you know alphas and stuff like that, and then go to a Formula One car. Right. And the first time you got in that thing, you'd be like, "Holy <laughs> cow, I'm going!" You know, light speed. We've gone plaid. You know, it's a uh, such a change. I wonder if there's a point where if they were slow enough, like, like a spec touring car class in RC, you know, we used to race TLO ones. It was all fixed to me as, you know, just for a price controlled race. Mm-hmm. I think if you had some sort of like a wireless GoPro sitting in that thing, I think your brain could probably adjust to it and go, okay, this is how the car is going to react to my inputs. And your brain would eventually get to the point where you're like, okay, this is what I, this is what I have. If you're talking at the same scale speeds that they do right now, that it, it is in, it would be incredibly difficult. See, in this conversation, it's the scale speeds that's killing the argument for me because I'm here as a sim racer, like ready to proclaim and declare RC more of a sim than than what we do within sim racing. Right, the scale speeds kind of throws a wrench in that because you're not. It's not even emulating a real life car even in anywhere close. These are out of these are like out of control speeds, and yeah. and so yet ours like you know an MX five in in i racing is amazingly close lap time to the real life counterpart. But so one other thing we talk about in sim racing are hacks, and there are two versions of hacks to me. There's unrealistic setting hacks that just, I guess it's the same kind of hack, really. It's, it's, it's unrealistic settings and maybe not the proper consequences for wrong settings as you get in real life, um, where excessive camber won't result in anything negative, so it's just the way to go, or ultra-low mm-hmm. tire pressure, for example. Um, you're not going to get away with that in RC because whatever you're doing is real. There's no argument. You can't argue the physics being good, bad, or ugly, right. If positive camber on the front worked, it worked, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. as wrong as it might be, you cannot argue it if it worked right. um, because it is real. There's no denying any of it. And there on that level, it's certainly more real. Um, you cannot get hurt, which is one of the big first things. The go-to argument against sim racing has always been, well, you can't get know, hurt. Well, I don't know. If you're a turn marshal, you get hurt. Yeah, how's your knuckle, Sean? <laughs> no, yeah, no, I meant in sim racing you can't oh, get okay, hurt. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I hurt my knuckle. Uh, you can't say you can't get hurt. I um, gave myself an owie. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the other would be like no consequences of your actions uh, physically and financially. Uh, RC racing, yeah. the financial is covered because you can oh, yeah. cost yourself a lot of money in a bad wreck. Um, I mean, they're pretty hardy cars, but still, if you're top, top quality, I don't think you'd take a big wreck and not replace stuff, I'm guessing. Oh, well, especially if you race indoor with poles. Yeah. So, <laughs> so jump right into a pole. Boom. So now you've got real life physics that you can't argue. You've got crash damage, which is one of the, the, the hits against sim racing, but you're stuck with the perspective and the there's no there's no of risk speed. of injury <laughs> right. right um well injury in in the manner of you driving if you if you're turn marshal and gotten hit by a car it doesn't feel very good oh those um, turn marshal i was thinking real life racing yeah even in rc those things oh, oh my god you'll you'll have a well in the bruise oh, I've that'll seen let... people go down <laughs> oh yeah me too yeah, especially the old uh, gold chassis rc 10 yep, era with those, a mod motor take, yep yep take one Catch, of those to the head yeah or the ankle or whatever you're, oh, you're... the ankle sucks yeah no good i'd rather get hit in the arm than the ankle totally different subject but i had an rc 10 um and i put foam I tires on it once and my buddy had his swimming pool drained, and we were all skateboarding it. But one day I was like, oh, shit, I'm bringing my RC-10 over. And, man, that car was so awesome in a swimming pool. It was really, really fun. <laughs> One of the best times I ever had was driving that RC in a swimming pool. That's funny. Oh. So, yeah, I guess the more you explore this topic, I guess, I think the RC car is something in and of its own thing. Just like we kind of say sim racing really is its own own thing even though it's yes. emulating yes. trying to emulate something sim racing is really 
its own thing. So I would have to say that uh, racing RC cars is its own thing. I don't know that it's nec- it may simulate some elements and may do it very well because there's a lot of those things that cross over. I mean, we were literally taking setups and our knowledge of shocks and stuff and applying them to the car, to the RC car, or vice versa, to the big car. You know, hey, we tried this. Should should we try this in the big car? Sure. I mean, there is some sense of crossover. You get to learn roll center, uh, all that, all the geometry. Yep. So. And the crossover is very common ground. And I dare say if you were to look at any sport, really, for the most part, you know, it's amazing how many athletes are good at more than one sport because there are a lot of crossover skills once you, you know, um, and maybe they're not, perfect like obviously in basketball you use your hands but like the patterns of basketball are amazingly similar to soccer you know triangles um and the way the ball moves and the way you defend and the way you attack um so much common ground that it's obvious that somebody would learn that second sport quicker you know they say the same thing about languages too and i think of it, it kind of because like a hard part about languages is often like the conjugation and so once you learn the format of conjugation beyond your native tongue, you sort of learn the basis of all languages to an extent. Um, and I think that that's sort of similar. So when we talk about that common ground stuff, it's like, you know, chances are somebody who is good at RC racing is going to be better at a real car than somebody who never did it at all because of that crossover skill. Same thing coming from sim racing. And I'd say the same thing about just about any sport um where there is crossover because they are similar but they're all unique and different awesome awesome yeah no i i I would have to say that sim or uh racing rc cars is its own thing versus sim racing is its own thing so i asked you at the beginning you know i know like i go play world warships roller coaster tycoon these are my diversion games candy crush when i don't feel like sim racing but i'm still a gamer at heart so when you play virtual RC, are you cheating on sim racing with a diversion game? Or is this just I don't feel taken? like it. And I and I think I I think I don't feel that way because there is the I, I liken VRC Pro to iRacing. It kind of has a lot of similar elements, not all of them, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of similar elements in it. Um, so the competition aspect. I mean, there's some, there's pro guys that run on here. It's more common, I think, during the winter, not so much this time of year, but there's, there's really fast people. I mean, these guys are really fast. I mean, to, for instance, I haven't raced RC cars in a long time, but I've been doing it. Like I said, I finished second, which equated to about 13th to 15th overall in about three, three of the six series that I tried. And that's not with a lot of the pro guys running right now because they're actually out running. My brother actually just won this weekend up in Chico at a big, at a big race in a two wheel drive. It's, it's funny. Okay. Turf is now, has been a thing for a little bit instead of dirt because turf is easier to do and maintain, but you still have. Yeah. So they, yeah, it's not grass. It's actual, it's AstroTurf basically and but that's different than carpet like indoor correct yeah this is this is like it's the fake grass however you want to say it but brian went and ran uh, this weekend out at chico when they had their big turf race and he won that so those guys aren't running right now but when they do run the boy, it's just like eye racing, man. They show you how slow you really are. <laughs> Holy crap! I mean, they just kick your ass, and you're just like, God dang it! How do you go so fast? So let me let's flip the script on this. All right. So Billy, you don't you know you don't feel like you're you're cheating on on sim racing by doing VRC or or probably even if you went and raced real RC, right? Because to me, VRC is a a money controlling method right because right because i get to race racing, all these different yeah. ones without yeah. yeah you know real rc racing it can get expensive you know i, I bought oh, a short God. course truck and 
you know, if you got you got to have the best tires, you know, the mini pins and they wear out real quick and they're super soft and they're 30 bucks for a pair. You need two pairs and then you got to have a separate set of wheels and, you know, you're looking at 150 bucks for wheels and tires. that's going to yep. run you a couple races. So yeah, it's like, that's not even getting to foams. Yeah, exactly. You know, so to me, VRC is a very good, it, it exposes you to it, but you're controlling costs at the same time because you can run forever, just like sim racing compared to real life racing. Um, Sean, yeah. when you were at Lucky Dog this weekend and when you did Chump Car at Button Willow, did you feel like you were cheating on sim racing doing the real life thing? No, I felt like sim racing was preparing me to go do that. Like, almost like more of a reward. Like, I sim race because I'm deprived of yeah. the real life racing. So when I got my opportunity to do it for real... That was the prize for my patience and for putting up with sim racing as a, I, and and now when I shifter carded, you know, I sim raced at night, so it's not like an either or. I'm a sim racer every day of the week, every night because unless I'm at the track, I can't do it. It's my favorite sport. It's my favorite hobby. It's my favorite form of competition, and I want to do it seven days a week. You know, for the most part, until, you know, every once in a while I need a break. But for the most part, this is my favorite thing to do for competition. Um, so, yeah, I I just felt like, yeah, it was, it was the prize. It was the prize of saving up money, setting priorities, and wanting to just race all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But now mm-hmm. I, th- I want to do a story on it, like a little more detail with some of the footage when I get the Gro- GoPro back. Um, I'm now sitting here thinking, you know, I've, I probably have 20 years of RC driving under my belt. Like, so I can't act like I'm some amateur to the concepts of, I, you know, of, and I've probably had 20 or 30 different cars and, you know, radios. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, I haven't done it in the modern era since the LiPo battery. That's like, those came out modular radios came out in my gen LiPos came out right after me. So okay. I'm like, oh, you know, but I've never officially raced. I did one exhibition race um, that was only three cars. It was me, Darren, and our friend uh, uh, Terry at the Tamiya Nationals track. But oh, okay. we were just racing ourselves, so it wasn't real. I would love That's to do pretty a much story. all I did was race was racing. Like I don't I don't play with RC cars right? really. I get bored. Oh, I used to uh, just so that's that's what we you know that's what we did my dad and i we and my brother we we went and raced rc cars because we couldn't race real cars at the time oh man that's that's what we did you're missing out billy if you've never played bumper tag do you know do you know what got me into rc cars funny enough the movie i can't remember which dirty harry movie it was but it was oh yeah the little little black black one the corvette Corvette. and so my beginning days of rc was loving to drive my car under real life cars so most of (laughs) i killed mini rc because i would wait for a car to drive up my street and then i'd chase them and see how far i could stay under their car before they'd find out or get annoyed and so i've gotten run over by a handful of cars and lost my rc Uh, now you know why there's regulations the car and turn left a little bit (laughs) amazing i still have a drone (laughs) <laughs> that's funny uh that's awesome well that answer your question sean yeah i think we had fun with the topic i this is a it's it's i this is something i've bounced in my head many a time you know the game versus sim and what's more and you know i i, I say it because i know some people will be offended by the conversation but in reality we shouldn't be offended at all they're no, they all but it's good offended. it's good to kind of yeah You'd play def- with the idea, poke holes and things, and you know maybe post uh, pose a question in that respect, which kind of challenges the idea of what you currently think of. I have just as much fun, you know, racing an RC car, whether it's virtually or in the real world, as I do. I get the same. In fact, I get more nervous racing an RC car. Out of everything I've ever done, racing RC cars and racing slot cars. I get the most nervous. I really don't get nervous racing in sim racing every once in a while. If the, if I feel like I have a chance of winning in like maybe a bigger race, I'll get a little nervous. And I really 
I got a little nervous racing big cars, but I'm usually not, you know, like one of those guys that can't eat before race. Fuck it, I'm hungry. I eat, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I don't get, it doesn't make me get sick or anything like that. So I get more nervous racing the flipping art. Like my hand will start to shake with, uh, on the radio doing the t- steering. Like if I think I'm in competitive, like I'm going to win, my hand will start to shake and I have to like take deep breaths and <laughs> calm myself down because I'm getting so wound up. And I think it has to do with the perspective thing. Like you can see more of what's happening where when you're racing, you just kind of focus out the front and that's it. Sure. I, you know, I get nervous for anything I do racing line, but I, as you were telling your version there, I thought, yeah, I know I get nervous, but I think part of it is that I, like getting nervous because it adds to my excitement so then i combine the two together um because my version of nervous is a little weird because it's like if you find me nervous i usually have a big smile on my face and if you ask me how i'm doing i'm like oh man i'm shitting my pants you know and 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 yet well what do you mean you're sitting you're sitting there ear to ear grinning you can't be shitting your pants right i mean that just doesn't make sense so again i do combine the two into one recipe that I seem to thrive on because I love that moment. You know, when when Steve's like, you're starting the car, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh. You know, <laughs> you know, it's, you know <laughs> I've never, I, I've never had that kind of a reaction. I, like racing the sprint car, I would get excited. And I would get like, if I started on the front row, where I knew I had like a really good shot of winning, I would get like a tinge of nervousness, like getting in the car, you get a little bit of the butterflies, but not like, oh God, I don't know, oh, you know, kind of doing this or feeling like, so I don't, and that's just from competing so much, I think from being a kid and racing RC cars starting at age, basically, I think five, and then having to run track and cross country and my dad always kind of ingraining in me like you have to control your nervousness like it, it's something that you can use to your advantage but you have to control that kind of thing so no. i i just i don't get nervous that way but sure enough man i start doing the stupid rc car and like the other day i was what was really cool is again, you can download the other cars, but you can make them not, uh, but you make them non collidable in your, um, in your final. Yeah, I'm watching videos and I was kind of wondering about that. If that was so, you don't, code so you can have them, intentional. No, it's so in the final, you don't, you, you don't, uh, you can do it without them, but I like putting them on because it, it puts a little more pressure on me. My flipping hand starts to shake. And I'm like, <laughs> you can't be serious. I'm playing this freaking rc and my hands starting to take i have calm down like because i had a shot at winning i mean (laughs) i'm literally battling with that other car even though we're kind of passing through each other every once in a while i can see that we're in content i'm in contention for a win so that's uh, awesome it's 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 kind of i don't know i've always been that way though slot cars and and the rc stuff I keep I've saying I'm getting been... this game. I'm I'm totally getting it again. Again, I've had it before, so it's not even. But yeah, I'll get the controller. The whole thing. We gotta we gotta play. You guys already so are. I gotta. The play moral of the story is: if you want to have a chance at beating Billy, slot cars or RC cars. Because <laughs> he gets well, really nervous. I don't nervous. say I lose. <laughs> I don't say I crash. Uh, at least have a nervous. You know, help his nerves get to him. So. Um, I have something I wanted to bring up with you two. All right. And just kind of keeping tabs on serious. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, but keeping tabs on the sim racing community, um, you know, and just what's popular. There's a lot of talk lately of coaching one-on-one coaching for sim racing. Um, and I'm kind of curious with you two being, you know, who you are in the community and stuff. What do you feel the pros and cons are? of coaching and what is the value or the perceived value? Um, Sean, what do you think? Um, I, you know, it really depends on your personality. And, and I think that it's, it doesn't even have to apply just to sports. There are people who are able of 
taking like criticism and there are people who defend against criticism um regardless of what you're talking about if you're getting some kind of coaching or education you first off have to be the type who's ready to absorb information willing to try different things not trying to be a know-it-all um i think you know and and so i mean the first step to it whether it has any value whatsoever would be your personality going in that being number one number two i think it also really depends on if you're willing to try these things you know so we're talking about cars specific right here but i think it applies to any sport um we all have habits that we do in all sorts of things but as drivers we have habits and sometimes those reward us well because our habits were created by our own education and sometimes they're actually hindering us from finding something new on what to do and in this case again talking cars how to handle the car in certain moments um so i think that coaching can be extremely valuable in that respect um because I take some of my habits to every track I go to, and I might not even try something. Um, and you're wondering why you're not as fast as some guy. Well, maybe he handles a section completely differently than you do. Um, that's in a race track, but a coach might see these things in you and break those habits. Um, I have to confess in answering this, I'm a little biased because, number one, I've been coached. Uh, and number two, I've been paid to be a coach. Um, so that's that's part of it. The other is coaching, I think, really does come down to a relationship too. Not all coaches are going to work for all players or drivers. And that finding a coach that suits you, that you work well together. But, you know, I'm going to use Tiger Woods as an example. Here is arguably one of the greatest golfers to ever be. And one of the stories of his career has been every time he's changed coaches because even the greatest golfer on planet Earth has a coach. <laughs> um, yeah. It is common for professional athletes to have coaches um, because, again, they're going to break you of habits that you might have developed even late in a career. You know, I think athletes across the board develop habits over time. And sometimes need to be broken because they're not doing it right or doing it optimally so i think a coach will see things in you that you don't see yourself even if you're trying to reflect and be self-reflective i think a coach when you hire a trainer like a fat guy hires a trainer at a gym it's to hold you accountable as much to show you what to do i mean you go to the gym you know what to do right the exercise are pretty obvious the machines you're a lot of times the trainers are accountability and i think that a coach will hold you accountable i mean like when mitchy was coaching me for example if i was missing a corner consistently he'd be like why are you not getting to the apex in three you know just as a driving critique there are a lot of different things he'd work on but you know just an example why are you and he'd hold me to a standard that obviously i wasn't holding myself to so again i'm open to coaching so when they do that, I believe in it. Now, me, I'm a little wacky. So, like, I mean, I worked with Fabio Martin. I believed in mental coaching. So it went beyond even just my driving. It was like, well, I think I can be a better driver if I can get a grip on my head. We talked about being nervous. You know, you work with a mental coach. Those are the kind of things they're working on, how to overcome those nerves. Because one thing I did say on Monday about l the Lucky Dog race is on Saturday, I drove really tense. I was nervous on Saturday. And I drove tense, and I was stabbing the brake a little bit, and I was jerking the wheel a little bit. On Sunday, I was a lot more relaxed, and I was really smooth, and it resulted in a really good drive. You know, I was doing very well on Sunday. Did okay on Saturday. I did very well on Sunday. Um, so, yeah, I think it all does have huge value. But if you think you know it all, then there's probably no point. Um, if you don't want to hear how much you suck at certain things or how much you're not doing what you swear or think you're doing, then it's not going to work. Um, if you go to therapy, you know, because you're trying to fix some <clears throat> mental aspect of yourself, 
you kind of have to be willing to make that change. You have to hear the diag diagnosis. You have to be willing to make the change, and then you have to go through the steps to make it right. Coaching is therapy for a driver. <laughs> you know, this is what you're doing yeah. wrong. This is how you correct it. Now work on it. Um, that's the, so. You know, not everybody's up for that. I am. I'll sign me up. I'll have a new coach tomorrow, and I'd be really happy because I think I'd get better. So there is that. There's my full answer. Matt, and I respect that. That's some some pretty good viewpoints. Um, you know, kind of curious what Billy thinks about it too. Um. So I know why this was brought up. Uh, and I will also say that I did watch Austin's video on it. So I have a little, did not read anything, but I did watch the video. And being a person myself that has helped other people learn to drive slot cars, or the like learn to drive slot cars or learn to race cars virtually there is a value because i think there becomes a point where you become your own worst enemy i have not charged anybody to do that that is not something that i have personally done i wouldn't bemoan somebody for doing that though because the value is all what the person has right we could be reductive and say how hard is this outside of the corner to the apex on the inside of the corner back to the outside right we can be reductive i can be reductive just the same way with football american football right you pull your arm back, you hold the ball this certain way, you hold, you pull your arm back, and however much force you put behind it and when you release it is where the ball is going to go. <laughs> right? We can be reductive with anything. So while I understand the points being made, I, it, it, like you were saying, it is so personal and individual. Not everybody has the ability to see. How many times, how many times has somebody said, I'm doing that, and you're watching them going, you're not doing that. Right. You're not. I can physically watch where you're putting the car on the track. And the person, I did it in the sprint car. I sat there and nod. That's what I'm doing. And the person's like, no. He's like, no, you need your tires up in the bumper. They're like, I am. And you're like, no, you're three car yeah. lengths inside. You're, you're, <laughs> but, so that's what my point being is that I understand the idea. Why would anybody really need coaching if they can just watch something, if they can just take the simple cues and just go, well, just do this. Mm -hmm. My argument would be then why doesn't everybody perform at the exact same pace if it's that simple, right? I have made the argument in the past that driving a race car, especially a modern one, isn't that difficult. But that's with the caveat of having basics and understanding of apexing, braking, and throttle application. The hard part is making yourself fast. We are not talking about getting – you have two types of coaching, right? You have coaching to get somebody – around the track and understand the fundamentals, right? They have driving schools, right? It's to right. teach you the fundamentals and then they have advanced courses. So there's another type of coaching, which here's where you're missing the line. Here's right. the, all the little pieces that you're trying to put together. I've done that with the sprint cars and I racing. I can't tell you how many people I've helped getting people to understand how to get the car around the track and then perfect the line. Sure. I've taken people that don't know how to do it at all. And I've taken people stands a good example. Stan knows how to get the car around the track. But when we were at Kokomo, there's certain things that you have to do at Kokomo to be able to make moves <laughs> and to, to get the car sure. around the track effectively. Sure. So my opinion is 
at some point or another, everybody's been coached, whether you're using a person, whether you're using data, right? Data's a coach. Data sure. tells you where you're being deficient. Yep. Yep. Is that any different than a person telling you where you're deficient? Right. Data's a coach. So I don't tend to take coaching in the traditional sense where in sim racing, that is where somebody's telling me what I'm, what I'm doing wrong. Like I'm not ask. I don't sit there and uh, grab somebody and say, Hey, come coach me. Right. It may be something that somebody says in passing, or I do a lot of this. I will watch, <laughs> I watch other people and that's how I learn. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see what I'm doing wrong. Right. Some people have that ability and some people don't. And then even when you do have that ability, sometimes you just not clicking with something and you swear you're doing it and you're not. It's just like when I learned to do the road racing, I knew how to get around the track. I understood the basics of throttle application, brake, and apexing. Right. But the small pieces in that track is where the guy that got me into it said, all you got to do is move over half, you know, half a car here and then... You can hold it wide open. Yep. Well, oh, okay. I was just taking a not as good of an approach as I could have been. Would I have eventually figured that out? Possibly. I could have figured it out by maybe following somebody. But that didn't mean I did that. That's coaching. He coached right. me. He just told me how to make myself better. Right. So, and if if you're going to, if we, if we talk about the dollar value in something, that is just worth what it is to the person that's paying it. It's relative, back, right? Right. Back to the topic of earlier, talking about spending $60 every year for an F1 title or just waiting three years and buying the next one, that is all relative to the dollar amount that the person sees in the value of the product that's being Absolutely. placed on them. Yep, so yep. if you find a dollar value in somebody helping you, then it doesn't matter. Yep. And if you don't find that dollar value, then you're not going to pay for it. Yeah. So well, there, there are times worth something, right? Yeah. And sure. so, you know, yeah, I would, I would say that if somebody is, oh, I don't know, for the big bizarre example, somebody keeps asking me, I need coaching. I need coaching. Okay. At some point you may say, okay, you're obviously taking up a lot of my time. My time is worth something. So maybe at that point, but they obviously see the value in that as well sure so i i coaching in general away from that specific topic coaching in general i don't think you can get away from you you get coaching in different aspects yeah no just to what, what degree right yeah and i there's value in it there's value in somebody taking you out of your comfort zone and saying move over you're, you're you are not doing it in the right manner you right. are you're stabbing the throttle yeah. slower application of the th way to the car gets straight these guys i mean how many times have we sat there with somebody and said you're actually way over driving the car right slow down a little and be smooth and make the but sometimes people get in their head like they see somebody else the great great example was um qualifying at Placerville one time in the sprint car and somebody's like you're holding it wide open and I try to go out there and hold it wide open I can't do it I end up hitting the cushion too hard or whatnot and I got better at qualifying as I went but I was terrible to begin with I got better as I went I had a couple TQs stuff like this so all I could tell the person was I'm not holding it wide open you just think I'm holding it wide <laughs> open I'm actually slightly massaging the car with the brake and the throttle as I'm going through the corner. But if the person thinks I'm holding it wide open, then they perceive that the way that they are supposed to drive. Right. And until somebody corrects them, they're going to think that, well, I just got to hold my foot to the floor and that's the way it goes. Sure. Yeah, sure. So I, yeah, there's, there is a, there is a value in coaching, whether it's monetary or not is up to the individual. And, sure. but I, in my opinion, everybody gets coached, whether you no matter, you may not be using a traditional method of coaching, but you're still getting coached. If you're looking at lap times, it's coaching. Sure. It's data. It's sure. there to tell you if you're doing it right or wrong. You know, uh, coaching is teaching, and being coached is getting an education, so to speak. 
and and when you turn to your fellow racer and you're like what gear are you handling that corner in well the minute they tell you they're giving you an education you know they're teaching you their method at least whether you take it or not is secondary but like you said we're being coached all the time anyway it's just yes you know it's somebody's a time of different manners being paid for um you know so that that i think is is very valid um uh, you know i also think back when i wanted to become a car mechanic i went and checked out how much it would cost to go to uti and we can clown uti and my education at uti all we want uh, but i literally when i was thinking do i want to go do this knowing what it was going to cost and what i would get out of it after a year or i can go buy myself a project car a haynes and a chilton manual and tear that car down to the ground and put it back together again which is how i as a child taught myself how everything in life was built and made um so why not just do that with a car and to me the biggest difference because i am capable of educating myself i am capable of research i'm capable of self-reflection i'm capable of finding my mistakes or, or accepting my mistakes so that i can learn from them um but with a coach with a teacher i felt that certain aspects of the learning curve would be done quicker because i don't have to learn by my mistakes i can be learned by being shown the way to do it um in the end i think each would have had their own advantages too you know so the self one well what i learned by mistake i would never forget but what i learned on that easier path maybe that would become a bad habit 10 years later when i had forgotten that right lesson you know well and you bringing that up just points to the fact that it was the value was relative to you right so the value became i'm going to go to uti and learn this rather than do it this other way which the other way may not cost me as much it might cost me more depending on my mistakes right <laughs> but you found the inherent value in somebody showing you how to do something yes where yes. somebody else might not find that value might not find that you know they were they were coached taught they learned in a different manner and maybe they're just like nah kind of already know all that stuff the few things that i don't know i'm just gonna i'm just gonna say the hell with it and just try it anyway and if i screw up i screw up yep yeah. there's there's no there's no I guess there, what I'm I, I'm getting at and what you've pointed to is that there's no real right answer. The The right answer is what is for the individual themselves. And it's a fence sitting or a, a maybe a cop out answer. But that's kind of the position I've always had with everything is, sure. is it worth it to me? Right. Is, is this, is this worth it to me? Like, again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to ask somebody to coach me. Mm -hmm. Me personally, I'm not going to sit here and in sim racing, ask for somebody to coach me. Just say, I'm just not going to do it. But I don't, I don't mind when somebody asks me to do that because I, I enjoy it. Right. I, I like to help people enjoy the hobby that we do. And so whatever helps somebody enjoy the hobby more, if they feel like they've got a value out of it, that does it really matter? What is, I'm, does it impact you in any way? I don't right, know. I kind of right. feel There's, like what? there is no downside because it's not right. like you have to. Like I have a friend who gets upset at people who spend too much money on a car because he thinks it's an absurd waste of money, and it's not and even a matter does whether. That buy? Well, and the the thing is, it's not even a matter of that person is wealthy or not. So, like one of his extra pet peeves are like people live in an apartment and drive like some hundred thousand dollar car. And well, maybe the car is more important. Well, and that's the thing. So, I mean, I see where my friend's coming from for his way of looking at life. But, like, to some other person, maybe they could just give a rat's ass what their house looks like because no one's mm -hmm. going to see it. Maybe they have no friends. So maybe there's no one to impress, and I'm a single guy, and I just need a one-bedroom. In fact, I don't even need a bedroom. I need a studio. Studio, yeah. You know, I, I'm going to sleep on my fold-out, whatever. I, you, you just... You honestly don't have to justify any choice you make in this world when that choice is for you and you alone. Right. Uh -huh. 
you know, and there should be zero spillover other than the others it affects. And if it doesn't affect me, I don't care. You know, I don't care what you want to do or don't do or what you spend your money on. And if it gives you enjoyment, then I tell you what, you're right. A hundred percent. I don't want, I've said this for a long time is I don't want somebody, I'm not going to tell somebody how to spend their time. And I'm not going to tell somebody how to spend their money because I don't want somebody telling me how to do that. Right. I don't want somebody telling. So I'm, while maybe I wouldn't do that, that's your thing. You, you do what you want to, you do what you want to do, right? We can make the argument, the same argument for playing any sort of video game, whether it's sim or regular video games. And somebody says, well, that's just a waste of time. But yet they sit there and they watch 40 hours worth of TV a week. Right. Right. To me, that's a waste of time. Sure. I could be, I, I hardly watch TV. Sure. So to me, waste watching TV is typically a waste. Of, I don't even hardly watch movies. To me, that wastes my time. I have so many other things that I'd rather be doing. So again, if we want to circle back to coaching, if they don't feel like their time's being wasted, we're, and we're talking about a scenario where the person doesn't feel cheated. If you feel cheated, then that that's a whole different sure. that's a whole different thing. Sure. But if we're talking about a scenario where the person, whether they paid or not, that's irrelevant. If they felt like their time was well spent in getting this coaching or advice or teaching, however you do it, then that's it. There is no oh you should feel bad there. It's irrelevant at that right. point. It doesn't right. it doesn't matter anymore because it's not affecting you. It's affecting the other person or the the person that it's affecting. They already are satisfied with what they got. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, I think coaching is a good thing. I think we all need somebody to tell us every once in a while what we're doing incorrectly. And coaching again can be a traditional somebody actually telling you, or maybe it's you just analyzing your laps, watching somebody else drive. I think we all do that. I think we need to do it. I think we should do it. If you think you're perfect, again, if nobody needs coaching, why isn't everybody running the same lap time? Right. Yeah. What? Why? You know, the if a if a race car driver sits there and tells you that a race, you know, a car isn't that hard to drive. I, I've actually had we. I've ran RC races where. Somebody said the track's too easy. I'm like, okay, then you should beat me. <laughs> and oh, wait, you didn't. Well, then it isn't that easy, is right, it? Right, right. There's still something so, to be better or worse at. <laughs> right. So th- that just mean that just tells me that yeah. that person could have benefited from me telling them how to get around the track better. Yeah. I.e. coaching. The the wow. thing for me when you just need to make it really basic and easy. Other than auto racing or things that you literally do have to buy your way into, you know, yachting. Um, there's no, <laughs> yeah, I like how he throws yachting a boat, <laughs> um, oversimplified boat. <laughs> there's, there is no way to play a sport without a coach, right? I mean, that's what we're taught from day one. Name your sport. If you want to play it in your high school, you know, or in your town, the first step was, here's your coach, <laughs> you know, little league, here's your coach, <laughs> you know, AYSO, here's your coach, get to high school, you think you're badass, here's your coach, you know, um, there is no sport that doesn't have a coach, and even when you get to the professional level, basketball, baseball, football, all of them, coach, 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 um, now, in some cases, these are guys who just play the calls or decide who's in and who's out, but that's not all they do, they practice, and when they're practicing, They're being coached. They're not just told, hey, run 10 laps. They are being timed. They are being watched. They are being critiqued on their form, on their speed, on their style, on their power. Um, Professionals, guys who earn millions of dollars, guys who earn 10 times what the coach gets paid are being coached. And not not to rudely interrupt you, but for that, I want to pinpoint that right there is professionals getting coached, right? you realize that they're paying a coach to tell them a very small amount of information. Right. Yes. They're only correcting one tiny thing. They're not telling them how to get a, a get from point A to point B. Right. They're they're going, "Hey, you get from point A to point B really well." Yep. But there's one thing, there's this yep. one thing that I've noticed that can make you just that better to get to point B. Yep. 
even better. Yep, well, we're and running that sweep to the right. You need to get yep. one more foot to the right because the linebacker is getting a line on you. That's that was the co- yeah. that was, but it was watch a million guy's, dollar piece of information. Watch this guy's hands. He actually tells you what he's going to do by the movement of his hands yes. just before he actually yes. moves. Yes, and and so no matter what, how much information that is, again, it is relative and to the person that is getting the information. Mm-hmm. You know, it you know, sounds like, like what you just described is like a uh, F1 crew chief or engineer or a uh, NASCAR crew chief when they say, hey, you know, you might want to make this little adjustment to achieve what we're trying to get here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, how many times do you hear those guys running around the track and all of a sudden the spotter calls up and this is NASCAR, but the spotter will call up and say, hey, so-and-so is catching you about two tenths a lap and he's actually diamonding three and four or he's running high in one and two and then low in three and four. Right. And maybe the person that's already driving was like half a car off. You know, you need to go all the way to the fence and yeah. try that, see if that works. Yep. That is that is a small thing, you know, and you're, you're paying that guy up in the spotter's booth. Mm-hmm. Or the stand. Yeah. So you, you, even when you're at the most there, like I said, there's two segments to coaching. There is getting you competent. And then there is refinement and getting everything you need, the performance you're trying to get. So yeah, I, I, I don't see a downside to any of it. Well, for me and you know kind of absorbing everything that's been talked about and stuff lately is from my personal experience what i would typically do when i was learning how to sim race and you know i wasn't a natural i'm not an alien uh you know i'm mid-level at best in my opinion um i have to do work to get faster and so when i started i racing what i did um like you billy i'm a very visual learner before I would even start turning laps, I would go in, look at the drivers, look at the fastest guy in the room, get in his car, spectate him, and I would learn my braking points. I would learn what gears I needed to be in by counting them because it doesn't always show you accurately. You know, listen to when he's trying to pick up the throttle, stuff like that, and go, okay, now I need to go out there and do the exact same thing and work myself up to that speed. And it's different depending on what I'm trying to do. Right. So if it's the MX-5 or something I've got some familiarity with or a track I kind of know, it's a lot easier because I'm closer to that point. But I know, Billy, I've, I've worked with you before with getting coaching in the dirt sprint cars because I, I watched your ISR video that you did when it when that content first came out. And I bought them and I was like, OK, this is what I'm supposed to do. And I do it. And even then, there's still it's so foreign Right. That there's such a disconnect that's like, okay, I still need help. And there's such little things that you can do, like don't flick the car into the corner. You let it rotate just because of the chassis setup, you know? And it's stuff like that that you taught me that really transformed my one, my enjoyment of the content because I was so frustrated with it. But two, just being able to process because you start chasing it and going, Well, is it the car? Is it the setup? Is it the track? Is it me? You know, what is it that I'm, I'm missing here? You right. know, so coaching in that aspect is a huge deal. So, you know, you were saying that you wouldn't need or necessarily ask for coaching for sim racing or something that you're familiar with. But, you know, say you got the itch to take up ballroom dancing or hell, I don't know, something crazy like that. I'm sure you might take a lesson or two, <laughs> you know, just so it's not such a, a shock to try and figure everything right. out so soon. So I think, I think everything has a, a value. Um, I think somebody's time, especially if they're at that level. I mean, if you place in the top 10 in a, a major competition like world's fastest gamer or any of those high, high end competitions, you know, with the Cronkies and Al Fallas and Brendan Lays and stuff, you know how to do something that's worth money. You know, it's it's a knowledge there or a skill set that I think, in my opinion, 
you know, if you're willing to share it with people, you should be rewarded for that. And if it happens to be money, then that's so be it. If it's somebody saying, hey, thanks, Billy, for showing me how to drive this sprint car, it's made a huge difference. If that's enough of a payment for you, that's awesome, you know, but it's still worth something, whatever that. Right. Gratitude. Yeah. The individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it's a perceived value, you know, so and that's on both sides. If if you're, you know, a pretty good guy on a Seto and, and you race in the real life and, and you're able to just go, you know, if you can oversimplify something down to that level to where it's easy for you to do, then that's awesome. But not everybody's that way. You know? Yeah, that's yeah. that's the point of it is not everybody's the same. Otherwise, we'd all be running the same speed and there'd be yep. no difference and nobody would need anything. But that's not reality. Reality is most of us at one point or another kind of get in our own way yep and yes. so however you figure out how to get around that is is just um is just how you learn yeah and yeah, some sure. and yeah. some people just need it in a different manner yeah some people need told some people can do it and at some point in the middle it crosses over so yep yeah. So well, that's awesome. I, I appreciate your guys' <laughs> input on that. I, I really value, I always have, and that's why this show is so awesome, but I really value your input on this stuff, both pillars in the sim racing community and, you know, real life experience and sim racing experience. And I value your input by far leaps and bounds above most everybody else in the community on, on situations like this. So I appreciate you guys weighing in on that. Well, thank you. I won't be able to fit out my uh, door now. But... <laughs> Just from the shoulders up, is that what it was? That's, yeah, well, I mean, I have to go sideways for the other one. Um, well, I don't know if you're sneaking cookies. You know, on that you. note, I do want to say, you know, if you're looking for coaching, just hit me up. I only charge about the <laughs> cost of a small mortgage or so, you know, not a big deal. <laughs> no big thing. No big thing. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, I, I just, I think, uh, I've always just taken the stance that if I see somebody that needs help, I just, I, I try to help because I want people to enjoy it. And that's just my particular stance. Yeah, that's sure. not, you know, that does, doesn't reflect on anybody else. They, anybody else can do whatever they want. I just, usually if somebody asks me for help, I, I just, I do what I can because I want more people to enjoy and participate in getting somebody to enjoy this hobby. will just keep them in it longer. <clears throat> if somebody gets something and they're so frustrated, you know, we, Again, we can be so basic, be so reductive about everything. Well, you just plug the wheels in and you just have the pedal in and it's just, you don't have to do anything else. Just drive the car. And you're just <laughs> like, that doesn't work that way. Yeah. It, there's so many other settings that can enhance what you're doing to make you go, oh, wait, this, this is what it's supposed to feel like. This is awesome versus... I don't even know what a slider does in the sim. What the F am I right. doing? And right. all I do is mess it up and make it worse. Yep. You I want to, people to stay in it. And I have to say for me, and this is something else about coaching across the board, like the people that I've worked with were people who I had been giving help to often, like you're saying. But then they, I think even they start to feel like, hey, I'm taking too much of this guy's time. Right. I agree. You know, and, and yet they want to enjoy what they're doing and they need yeah. more of an education. So they're willing to, you know, pay to, to talk, to take you uh, appreciating your time. It's just a thank you. Yeah. And, you and, know, thanks for the time and your help. And then yeah. for me, like, you know, I might only be the equivalent of the coach that you would get at little league or high school, you know, like I'm not. Um, you know, I'm not going to get hired by an NBA team to coach at an NBA. Right. I'm in the know? same boat. Yeah. And so like, I will tell people, it's like, Hey, you know what? If you're looking for somebody to get you from getting into this to getting comfortable, I can coach you. But if you're looking at how to become that next esport, I'm going to be a little limited versus getting somebody who knows some of those alien level driving skill yes. tricks and observations. Um, but maybe that coach would be the worst coach for you to get out of the gate because they're not going to care about getting you comfortable. They're going to be like, you suck. You're not doing this right. You you know, uh -huh. and, and it's like you better come to them with a certain level of skill too. Um, so, so, you know, I think that getting – and I guess that goes back to something that I was saying earlier that, that different coaches with different people, you know, it's part of it is the pairing. It's a relationship, they, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. is. It really is a relationship, and, and it needs to be a two-way street in that way. Yeah. So. Well, that, 
real quick, that just goes back to, I think I said it last week or the week before, in sprint cars, you see that where somebody comes in and a new person, they just try to give them the hot setup and the person's all over the place. Again, you have the exception where the person gets, you know, takes to it like a duck to water or fish to water, whatever you want to say. Bad analogy. And for the most part, you you take Steve Kinzer's setup and you put it on a new person's car and they can't make it around the track. And that's, you know, literally I got told, we're going to make you get the fundamentals first because you're not Steve Kinzer and mm-hmm. you can't drive like Steve Kinzer. Right. That's just the way it is right now. And then you can get to the point where you can drive like that. Right. And we will set the car up like that. And it's, yeah. it's again, there's different levels for that. Mm-hmm. If anything, they might have been doing you a disservice if they would have said, Absolutely. or they wouldn't have, if they would have just said, oh, go out there, draw the straightest line you can around the track and just hold her wide open as much as you can. Right. Because then you're going to go out in your, your rookie Miata race and you're going to go out there and you're going to slam into somebody and do it again and again and you're going to run off track and you have to get towed and it's just going to ruin your experience. Mm-hmm. Very true. So. That's very good insight. I appreciate it, guys. Um, I guess, Sean, we know you have something major coming up. Um, yeah, I got a few things coming up. I mean, first thing I do want to talk about uh, before I get to me is, oh, look at this. I'm, I've got some other video playing. That's not good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, what kind of video was it? It is well, PG. I was We're say, okay. I can't see the video. Yeah, <laughs> no, but, some guy um, jumping a BMX something bike. Good. <laughs> Somebody uh-huh. jumping a BMX bike. Um, no, but I do want to remind people that, uh, tonight what it would be, cause it is Friday, right? It's Friday. Um, yeah. tonight the Sim Pit Truck Series is going to get going, kicking off the new season. 440 is when the race room is going to open. Racing starts at 610, qualifying at six o'clock. So about an hour and 20 of practice. Um, this week we'll be at what, Kansas? Yeah. Kansas is this week. I might make it in attendance for the race, but I don't think I'm going to be able to race because I am leaving tomorrow for Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm going to be doing some work with Hendrick. By tomorrow, you mean Wednesday? Yes, yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Wednesday. No. (laughs) I'm flying to Charlotte, and I'm going to be working with Hendrick. Um, And by the time you watch this, I will actually be on my home, on my way home, so um i'm doing that this week so i'm super excited it's gonna be a great week nice and, and then i'll That's come cool. home and i'm dying to do some sim racing though because i've been away once again for quite a while so i'm i'm you know this getting on the road thing is killing my sim racing let's get you a suitcase sim rig yeah right, there you go <laughs> how about you right. how about you brandon billy what are you guys up to um i don't have a ton going on i'm just looking forward to getting some more racing in um Pretty much, yeah. I'm, man, me and me and Ovals don't get along. I still haven't even tackled that learning curve yet. So, um, don't plan on doing the truck race, but I might do some uh, SRS this week. Hopefully, can get around to doing some cart craft. Um, give that a crack, and then uh, yeah, see what's going on this weekend. Maybe have some fun. Cool. What about you, Billy? Uh, I'm gonna try out the dirt, the new dirt rally cars. Probably do a little VRC. Uh, I will race the truck race this Friday. Yes. Unless something happens, but I will race the truck race. And I don't know. Probably throw in something else in between. Brandon, are you going to stream the truck race? Uh, if you, Yeah, absolutely. If you want me to stream the truck race, I will absolutely yeah. stream the truck race. So it will be streamed. Uh, and then the following races, uh, I'll be able to give you my in perspective from the race view. So, uh, But yeah, again, if you want to do that, just check out Simpit Truck Series on iRacing under the league section. Everybody who's already part of that league would be eligible. Um, it'll just ho- show up under the league sessions starting at 4.40 p.m. Pacific Standard Time this Friday night. Tonight, tonight, tonight. <laughs> friday 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 uh, anything else you guys no boy i think that's it thanks again for having me back it's uh it's always such a blast to do the show and uh i miss it i do but here pretty soon i'll be back to the real world and uh making money to pay for my coaching so <laughs> <laughs> well thank you for stopping by yeah anytime no. Thank you, guys. I, I had a blast once again doing the show. We went two and a half hours. I don't know if you realize that. Without even talking to the audience today, we went two and a half hours. So oh, wow. always something to talk about in sim racing. 
<laughs> can def oh, what somebody said we are the Seinfeld of sim racing. <laughs> I think somebody said that. Oh, and I'm not going to disagree. Pretty funny. Pretty funny. Anyway, thank you guys once again. It's been a blast, but that's going to do it for this one. So hopefully uh, you will be back next Friday. Well, I'll be back next Friday. We'll be a live show. We'll be able to take your comments and questions during the show. But once again, I want to thank Brandon Waters, Billy Strange for joining me for another edition of Beyond the Sim. I'm Sean Episode Cole. Episode 20. This is Beyond the Sim, and we will see you on the track. See ya. Take care, everybody.